Thumbs up? All right. How's everybody doing this morning? Good? Relatively well? Yeah? Um, my name is Aaron Gustafson, and I work for Microsoft, and I do a lot of work in web standards and accessibility and such. Uh, but for the last two and a half years, I've been working a lot on PWA um, and thinking a lot about kind of where the, the future is going with this stuff. So I'm, I'm particularly excited to be here to listen to y'all um, talk about what you've been doing, whether you've, you're actively involved in building PWAs. Um, and that sort of, of stuff, or whether you're, you're thinking about it or whether you've written it off and you're, you're willing to be convinced otherwise. Um, but before uh, we get started with this workshop and roundtable, I want to kind of go around and just find out um, where y'all are from, what companies you're from, what, what you're representing, and, and whether you've kind of gone down this PWA path already or if it's something you're still exploring. So I'm going to start over here on this side. Start with you. Uh, I'm Joe. Okay. This is Joe from Facebook, and they're thinking about PWAs. Sorry, we have. Can we get the mics around here? Sorry, we're gonna. This whole event is being live streamed, um, and so we've got seven mics that we'll work on getting around so people can actually. But for right now, we'll just pass the mic down. Uh, so Sorry. I'm Joe from Facebook. Um, we're thinking about PWAs, um, but we're just kind of exploring it right now. I want to learn more before we dive in head first. So uh, that's why I'm here. Cool. Thanks. Um, I'm Yen from Pinterest. Um, we recently uh, rewrote our entire mobile app um, as a PWA, and we've had a lot of success with it. So, yeah, I'm really excited about learning more from you all. I've been reading up on the white papers and such, so good stuff. I'm Will, also from Pinterest, and uh, yeah, mobile PWA as well as um, using our desktop PWA for Windows. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, Felix. Hey, I'm Felix. Uh, I'm with Slack, and we are also in the process of building a PWA. That's news. Hi, um, I'm, I'm Naveen I'm from Bank of America. We, are, we haven't looked at PWS yet, but in the process of. Cool. You want to hand it, back to, hand it back to Jeff behind you, and then we'll make a little circle around. Unless we can get another mic over here for, for next. For Jeff. All right. I'm Jeff from Microsoft, and uh, we build lots of PWAs and browsers and fun stuff like that. If, if you haven't heard, Office is actually moving over to PWAs. They just relaunched the My Office app as a PWA, which is kind of cool. So. Hey, I'm Don Williams from Samsung. And I work a lot on the Galaxy Store with the apps and everything. We're integrating PWA. Hi, I'm Ingrid Mariotti from Sling TV. We are in the process of developing PWA. Um, could you send that live stream link? I'd love to send it to um, someone. Yeah, so the live stream link, are you on the uh, Slack channel by any chance? No. So if any of you haven't joined it, it's, uh, if I remember correctly, progressive-web-apps is the Slack um, org. And then there's a roundtable channel in there. Um, and that's where I think the live stream link, if not Justin over here in the corner, can also get you the, uh, the stream link if you want to send that to, to colleagues. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Peter from uh, Facebook, and uh, our team does not use the PWA, but I've worked on PWAs before Facebook. Cool. Thank you for coming. Uh, and I'm Isabel from Pinterest. <laughs> Good group from Pinterest. All right, run, Milo. Run. Chuck. Run. Hi, I'm Chuck. I'm from Reddit, and we're currently testing PWAs. Hey, I'm Jordan. I'm also from Facebook, um, and I think it's been covered already. Where Does it say that none of the Facebook people are sitting together? I'm just, <laughs> just. Yeah, there you go. Hi, I'm Dave, the developer of uh, a sketching app called Concepts. We're currently investigating PWAs. Very cool. Hi, myself, Anjali. I'm from Bank of America, and we work on mobile banking. Wonderful. Hello, Diego Gonzalez here from uh, Samsung. I'm working with the Samsung Web Platform team uh, from the UK. Hello, my name is Dongu Im, PM of the Samsung Internet. Hi, my name is Reza. I'm a, a PM at Tubi doing web, doing web development as well as the UWP apps. So. Hey, I'm Brandon from Tubi also. And yeah, we're interested in learning more about uh, progressive web apps. and how that can work for video. Fantastic. Hello, I'm Justin. Um, I work at Microsoft on PWAs and web stuff in general. Um, so yeah. 
Hi, I'm Uzair from Twitter, and we've had a PWA since May of 2018. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm also with the uh, Samsung team. We're all about the uh, PWAs. Awesome. All right, well, welcome all of you, and thank you all for joining us for this. Um, so as I mentioned, this whole thing is being recorded and live streamed, um, and there will be more mics that we'll, we'll get around, so it'll be a little easier for you to jump in uh, with questions and such. Um, if you feel like tweeting stuff out, we're doing the hashtag PWAFTW for For the Win, not the uh, motorcycle gang version. Um, so that's uh, PWA all caps and then FTW lowercase. Um, we really want this to be a roundtable open dialogue. Um, we want you to ask questions. We want you to challenge the folks in the room who kind of pull the strings as to what is possible in the browser. That includes Microsoft and Samsung. Uh, we may have some Googlers uh, show up later as well. Um, you know, we want to know what your pain points are, and we want to know how we can make uh, the web work for you, and especially PWAs work for you. Um, my one ask is, you know, treat everyone respectfully. You know, listen attentively. Um, and uh, you know, don't talk over each other and such. We would really appreciate that. Um, so the first person I'm gonna introduce is Jason Grigsby. Uh, Jason and I go back a really long time to back when he was starting to work on mobile web stuff, gosh, probably 2007, 2008, I don't know. It's, it's been over a decade. Um, but Jason's really been on the forefront of what's happening with progressive web apps. And not only from a technical standpoint, um, and from a user experience standpoint, but also what it means as a team to be rallying around this thing that is progressive web apps. Like, what do we need to start thinking about? How do we need to, to operate? Um, he's the co-founder of Cloud4, which is a consultancy up in Portland, Oregon. Um, he also created Mobile Portland, which is an open device lab. If you're not familiar with those, those are an awesome resource for being able to go and test on real devices, uh, in many cases, really crappy devices that, uh, that you can make sure your site is still working well on. Um, and he just recently uh, had his book on progressive web apps published by A Book Apart. It is called Progressive Web Apps. Um, and all of you for attending, as a nice thank you, are getting a digital copy of that. Um, so Justin over there will be able to supply you with the, uh, the codes to be able to download that, that, download that book. Um, it is fantastic. Uh, I got to read it a little early on. Um, and it is a stellar book on progressive web apps. Um, and he also maintains, along with his colleagues at Cloud4, um, the PWA Stats Twitter uh, handle and website, and that is a fantastic resource for uh, learning what successes people have had with their progressive web apps. Um, so if you haven't checked that out, I highly recommend that. So now I'm going to invite uh, Jason to come up and kind of talk to us about sort of the, the basics of, of understanding what PWAs are all about and how we begin to integrate them into our workflow. So without further ado, Jason. Am I on? I can't tell if the mic is working. Not on, yet. Not on but the mic is on back here. It is green. Uh, sorry. Uh, I see, I pulled it down. All right. Sorry about that. OK, so thank you all. I'm. I'm Excited to be here, uh, excited particularly to be able to talk to people about progressive web apps, which I'm excited about not just for the opportunities it creates for your business, but also um, sort of what it can do for the web. And I want to start out um, sort of exploring just a little bit about what a PWA is, but not from the traditional like, hey, like this is the definition of a progressive web app. But I want to talk about it actually because I see a lot of some variation of this concept happen. People wondering what the heck a progressive web app is, seriously. This was written by Ben Halperin. And what I think is important to note about this article is he wrote it actually after he had shipped a progressive web app. So he had actually successfully created a progressive web app, but didn't yet know what the definition of it is. And I think that that's because while there was an original you know, definition with 10 factors in it, everything from things being responsive and being connectivity independent, having app-like interactions, discoverable, installable, um, linkable, and progressive, which are actually the two that I think are the most important ones, 
um, because we've had attempts in the past to create app-like experiences using web technology, whether it's Adobe Air or whether it was things like um, PhoneGap. But actually, those things only used the web. They weren't actually part of the web, and progressive web apps are part of the web. So you've got this original 10-part definition, and Google then starts promoting progressive web apps, and they bring it to their website. And of course, they, can, they bring across the first 10 definitions. Um, but a year later, Google takes that definition and narrows it down to just six things. And this is actually a good list, right? Like instant loading is actually something that's really important for PWAs, that they're, they're fast, um, that they can be added to the home screen, they're secure. Like this is actually the list that I think is what users will care about. Um, but a year later, they decided that that wasn't good enough. And so they decided to make it reliable, fast, and engaging. Um, I don't really know what that means, to be honest with you. A little later, they added integrated. Um, so that now they've got this acronym, which is FIRE, right? So progressive web apps are on fire, right? Fast, integrated, reliable, engaging. I think Craigslist might be a PWA because it's fast, reliable, engaging. I don't know about integrated, but um, I, I don't know what to do with these definitions. And I think that this, this sort of confusion causes people to not know what it means. I just want to take this definition and and frankly, even though I've got friends at Google, I just want to burn it up. <laughs> I want to start over with something that makes more sense. So just as a bare baseline, a progressive web app is a website that has HTTPS, a service worker, and a manifest file. Right? So the main piece that makes it powerful is a service worker. That's a technology that allows us to, to um, intercept network requests, control what we do with them, control caches, it's the thing that makes things really, um, like the real power behind progressive web apps happen in that. But I think that this is really important to understand that the baseline is just a website with these three features because the stuff that gets us really excited isn't that baseline, right? The stuff that gets us excited is that we can build experiences using progressive web apps that previously would have required a native application. So on the one side, we've got something that basically just feels like a website, but it's faster, it's using, um, it's secure, it's got a service worker. And on the other side, we've got something that, that's, that looks like something we've never seen the web capable of before. And in between, we've got all these different gradations. And, and as teams try to figure out what that means for them, what they should actually build, it becomes challenging because we don't have a common definition. If we walk into a room and say to people, hey, we want to build a progressive web app, nobody knows necessarily what that means. So when I was working on the book, I, I realized that there were really five factors that I saw organizations sort of grappling with as they made decisions about what their PWA should do. And there are you know, the least complex versions of these five factors and the most complex. Right? How much does it feel like an app? How much do you care about installation and discovery? What are you going to do with that offline functionality that service provider or that the service workers provide you? What are you going to do with push notifications, if anything? And then what are the things that aren't actually technically part of the definition of PWAs, but that people oftentimes think about with PWAs that you might want to incorporate? So I'm going to go through these so that we can talk about sort of what makes sense and understand sort of the, the bare minimum that you might do in these and sort of the complex versions of them. And I'm going to start with actually the one that's probably the most challenging, which is making it feel like an app. Now, this is really challenging because, frankly, we don't have a shared definition of what it means to have something feel like an app. Chris Coyer with CSS Tricks did this survey where he asked people, if they thought that making a distinction between websites and web apps was meaningful, whether it was important. And 72% of the people who responded, yes, they are different things with different concerns. But if you were to go to that article and look at the comments on that article, you would find no agreement about actually what the difference was. As a matter of fact, Jeremy Keith says that like obscenity and brunch, web apps can be described but not defined. And the reason this matters is that if you bring a team into the room and you start talking about a progressive web app, everybody around the table is going to say, yes, we should build a progressive web app. This makes sense. We're going to have something that feels like an app. And everyone's going to have a different vision of what that means in their head. 
So as a team, you have to come together and come to some sort of common sense of what that means. So I think that it's less useful to really think about this as sort of apps versus sites, but to actually start looking at the characteristics of what we might think makes something feel more like an app. So the first thing that might make something feel more like an app is the ability to make it feel native, right? To adopt the design language of a particular operating system. So maybe we use material design to make it feel like an Android application. Maybe we do work to make it feel like an iOS application. But then you start wondering, like, how many platforms are you going to do that work for? And what about desktop browsers? We never really felt like it was necessary to actually have our designs map to Mac or Windows operating systems um, when we were building web applications. And then do we jump every time a platform changes? Microsoft releases Fluent Design and our web application, our PWA needs to change to map to that. Or I remember when iOS 7 came out with flat design instead of skeuomorphic design and all of the native app developers were redesigning their platforms in order to match that new operating system look and feel. Like, are we going to do that? Um, and my argument would be that we should define our own designs and be consistent about that. Um, so I'm going to take one and just sort of declare that this is what I think is the best practice. Um, Tripcase does a really good job of this. Tripcase is a application created by Sabre Corporation. It's actually a phone gap application. It looks very similar on Android or iOS. Like it doesn't feel either, it doesn't feel like either platform necessarily. It kind of feels maybe mobily, for lack of a better term. I'm not sure what how to describe it, but it works. Like it works in either context, and it's actually a great application. Another way that we might think about making something feel more app-like is to have a more immersive experience, to take up more of the screen real estate. And this is one of the advantages of a progressive web app, is that in our manifest file, we can actually declare what display mode we would like. So we can say, do we want it to be display browser, minimal UI, standalone, or full screen? Now there's a tremendous temptation, like we've been constrained by browsers for so long, as particularly on these small devices, we've had to fight, you know, to have, if we were dealing with 320 by 480 pixels and we had browser Chrome sort of surrounding that, like our canvas was really small, so it's incredibly tempting to take over that full screen, to go and have that full immersive experience. But we're a bit spoiled by our browsers. We don't realize all of the features that browsers provide for us. Inside the warm comforts of the browser, we get access to the status bar, the, the back button. We have things like info and refresh and download, tabs, find and page. Um, the ability to share, to print, to email. And when we move out of that, when we go to full screen, we are in essence roughing it in the same way that native app developers are, who have to make conscious decisions to add every one of those features back and figure out what the implementation of those are going to be. Even doing something like adding the back button can oftentimes be harder than it seems. Like there's an assumption in native apps of this sort of app hierarchy where you go from uh, say like the home screen to the category page to the, to the product screen and then back up to category and down and you've got this very strict hierarchy that the app enforces. But on the web, we don't expect that. We actually expect people to just follow links, whether it's via social media or whether it's via search results. And so you will have somebody who comes in directly into a web page. And when that happens, where does that back button in the page go to? And does it go to a different place than the one that the browser's providing? They look very similar. Spoiler, in this case, they actually go to different locations. Should there even be an app back button in a situation where the browser is providing the button? Because if we do do this, if we do provide sort of this app back button and the browser's providing its own button, we can get into really strange situations. Like in this um, Polymer shop demo, I can actually get into a spot where um, if I hit the back button, um, I can go to the category page. Or if I hit the forward button, I can go to the category page. It just depends on which combination of buttons I decide to pick. All roads lead to the category page, right? Fortunately, browser makers, standards providers have created a media query that we can use to sort of determine whether or not we're in full screen mode, what display mode we're in, so that we can modify our UI accordingly. But 
the point really for me isn't this technology piece. It's actually thinking about the fact that in the same way in which responsive design forced us to start thinking about what it means to design and build for a continuum of screen sizes, we actually need to start thinking about designing and building for a continuum of context, right? Browser context. We may have people who have installed the application to their home screen, may not. They may be on mobile, they may be on desktop. Like their experience of our PWA can be very different. They could have installed it via some sort of app store. I think that it's very likely that the majority of people who visit a progressive web app will not install it to the home screen, right? Like, certainly would be nice if they do it, but um, we're going to get sort of as the big entry point into our funnel, all sorts of web traffic going to a progressive web app. And the number of people who then take that next step to actually you know, add it to their home screen is going to be a smaller percentage of it. But the great thing is, is that every visitor to a progressive web app actually installs that progressive web app. Right? The service worker gets installed behind the scenes. The only thing that adding it to the home screen gains a user is the declaration of full screen right? and the icon. Right? The display mode decoration, I should say specifically, it doesn't have to be full screen. But those are the only features that get added when somebody adds it to the home screen. All the other functionality, the service worker, push notifications, anything else you want to do with the PWA is available to a user when they visit your website. On that first page load, the service worker gets installed behind the scenes. On the second page load, all the benefits of that service worker from a performance perspective are available. One other thing we need to keep in mind is that losing our URLs Right? By going full screen is a pretty big deal. Um, we might care about social, and so maybe we want to add all these social icons back, and now we've got a NASCAR version of our website. Um, but only two out of 1,000 mobile users in one study actually tapped share buttons. Um, so we need to make sure that if we're going to go full screen and we lose the URL, that we provide ways for people to copy and paste the URL to get access to it quickly. And there's a new web share API. Um, which actually I just saw um, as of the last uh, Safari release is available in Safari as well. So now we're getting pretty decent support for the web share API. So you can use this API and you can get access to the native sharing controls. So you can bring that functionality back into your progressive web app. Another way that something might feel app-like is to have sort of this fast and fluid experience. And this is where I start to think that we get into the areas that people are thinking of when they think of something that, that feels native. Um, so we could make sure that we provide immediate feedback so that when somebody taps on something, we make sure that they're, they're able to see that, um, that something has happened. Um, we could do things like WeGo. WeGo has a fantastic progressive web app. To be honest, it's probably my favorite progressive web app. And they do a lot of work to make sure that as somebody is navigating through the application, that it reinforces the navigation paradigm. So you, know, you dive deeper into the application and things slide in from the left. There's animation opening up uh, various aspects of the application. As somebody you know, completes their transaction and then decides to maybe go back up because they realize that it didn't have something, things slide in the opposite direction. Right? We're making sure that we're reinforcing that navigation. We can also use service workers to solve what is the bane of my existence, which is you're reading an article on the web on your phone and ads load in late or photos load in late and then like the page jumps around all over the place and you're, you're like, you all have experienced that, right? Like incredibly frustrating. So we could use service workers to actually cache um, placeholder images, cache placeholders for ads and then bring them in later and so that the pages don't jump around. Another way that we can provide sort of this um, great native-like experience is that we could use the app shell model. This is something that Google spends a lot of time promoting. The idea that we're going to take the sort of shell of the application, the pieces that are consistent from page to page, and cache it in the service worker so that when somebody visits the page, we can instantly load that. And this makes a big difference because the perceived performance matters much more than the actual performance. Um, I, as a matter of fact, uh, the Washington Post had a um, had this really nice experiment for a while, <laughs> or at least an experiment for me, uh, <laughs> where I could actually run the version of their mobile website before they implemented a PWA and the version with the PWA. And I could test a bunch of stuff. And in particular, I got a chance to test the fact that on iOS, they didn't yet support service workers. 
So the PWA was really a question of like, how are they implementing this new website and how does it feel faster? And one of the things that was really interesting was that there were a couple times where the mobile web version would actually complete downloading faster, but at no point did it actually feel faster than the PWA. So I've got this little video here real quick. Um, and the video on the right is the PWA on iOS, no service workers. So it's not like all the features that you would expect from a PWA, but it will look like it loads faster. It'll feel faster, but the one on the left actually completes downloading faster if you watch the progress bar. And it goes really quick, so I'm queuing it up in that way. All right, here we go. In every instance, the progressive web app felt faster than the mobile website, even in situations where like that, where the mobile web felt um, actually took less time to download. And that's because the banner was able to stay on the screen for that entire process. It wasn't a full page load to get to those subsequent pages. In many ways, I think progressive web apps are a Trojan horse for performance, right? Like in the act of trying to build a progressive web app, you end up focusing on performance. You end up building stuff that's faster, even if that particular device doesn't support a progressive web app. So this idea of an app shell, um, it can be sort of a hidden bit of scope creep, right? Like it might mean that what you have to do in order to get to a progressive web app is re-implement your application as a single page application. And if you're already doing that, great. But if not, that can be a major overhaul of the way that the application is architected. Um, we don't have to have single page applications to have progressive web apps. That's not a requirement. As a matter of fact, some of the fastest progressive web apps are ones that are actually taking advantage of you know, the full web stack, including the server, to build stuff that's much faster. Um, when people attempt to put far too much into JavaScript, we end up with web pages that run slowly on mid-tier devices. The final thing I want to talk about about making something feel like an app is, is sort of adding this personality and polish, this idea that, that apps just feel better, that they they delight people. Um, so first, there's nothing inherent in native UIs that make them have delight. Uh, this is a website from a few years ago. I wish somebody would, I probably should take the time at some point to go do this. But these are all native iPhone UIs, all using what Apple provides. And um, they are ugly, right? Like, like everybody's seen ugly native applications. Just because it's native doesn't mean that it's going to delight people. I think though that, that there is a sense that oftentimes uh, when people are working on native applications that they're paying more attention to the detail and polish. And that could be just the expectations of the app stores. It could be um, that they can start from scratch as opposed to dealing with legacy code. It could be that they don't have sort of all of the various um, devices that we deal with on the web. But there's no reason that we can't add those sorts of things to our applications. Um, for example, Sarah Drasner has this really great example of providing native-like transitions as we move from screen to screen. So in this case, uh, watch the profile image as it changes for Sophia as we go from sort of her home page to her places to her trips. And so we can provide those types of animations, particularly in situations where we don't do full page loads between screens. And we have the ability with animation to add a bunch of personality. So this isn't a PWA, but this is just this great um, example of, you know, like a monster sort of hiding its eyes. And then if you hit show password, it peaks, right? Fantastic example. And this are the sorts of things that are possible on the web. One of the things to ask yourself is, to what degree does feeling like an app actually have to be a goal for your organization? Um, I don't think that it should be a goal unto itself. Your customers probably aren't going to care too much what end of the app versus site spectrum they fall on. They're going to care about whether they can complete the tasks that they've got and whether they have an exceptional experience. You know, whether somebody from the outside judges that as being an app or a site really shouldn't matter, right? and probably isn't terribly effective in terms of something you can measure. So, um, so figure out what actually matters to you, what factors would make a difference for your business, and then, and then pick which, how much you want it to feel like an app. So again, we've got this continuum, right, between a website 
that uses progressive web apps for just sort of performance improvements, but that people might look at and say, oh, that's a site. Now, it actually can be a progressive web app. There's no reason that it can't be. And something that on the other end is full screen, is attempting to mimic native UIs, um, native design language, and has all of that complexity. Installation and discovery is the second factor. So for installation and discovery, browsers have provided us with some great tools. We have the ability to have add to home screen prompts. So in Firefox and Samsung, these are implemented as badges. Um, and so there are little um, indicators that indicate that you're on a PWA that you can actually add to your home screen. On Samsung, it moves from being a star to being a plus. And if you tap on the plus, you get to see the bookmarks and add to home screen. These are very subtle. As a matter of fact, that's probably why Firefox added um, a little note that actually says, uh, hey, you've just encountered a new icon. This is what it's for. This is what users see the first time they, they encounter a progressive web app. Um, by contrast, uh, Chrome and Opera, at least originally, were doing something like this, where they had sort of a larger banner that took up more screen real estate and that people wouldn't miss. Um, and one of the things that was really nice about this is that um, Alex Russell has written about how Chrome was seeing um, higher install rates from the PWA banners than they were seeing from the native app installation banners. Part of that was that they were using add to home screen heuristics to measure how engaged somebody was with the website before they would prompt people to install it to the home screen. Um, this will continue to be the case. Now, Right now, what will happen is that you can just, after you pass a threshold, the browser will prompt it. But you can choose to not display it at that moment. Flipkart did this. They basically said, OK, we know that the user has passed your threshold browser. Thank you very much. We're just going to hold on to this permission. And we're going to wait until after the user completes their order. And then we're going to ask the user to add it to their home screen. And by doing this, they saw a 3x increase in installations to the home screen. Now, this is a best practice now, but not a requirement. In the future, it will likely be a requirement. Because we've already seen um, Google move from having sort of those large banners to what they now call the mini banner, which is that little one in the middle that says Twitter, you know, add to home screen. Um, and then on the final version, they actually have they're moving towards a thing where it will be a full banner, but or a full modal that shows up. But you can only that'll only show up if you prompt it. So it'll be up to you to decide when it makes the most sense to prompt. And more importantly, users cannot dismiss that modal. They either accept or block. And once they block, you never get a chance to ask again. And this is a theme throughout all permission UX is that we need to be clear when we ask for permission, whether it's permission for push notifications, which I'll talk about in a moment, or whether it's permission for adding to home screen, or geolocation, or any of these sorts of things. We have to have a reasonable level of confidence that people will actually accept that permission prompt, or people will reject it, and then you'll never get a chance to do it again. What about app stores, right? That's how we find a lot of stuff from native applications. Well, the great news is PWAs don't need app stores, right? Unless you want them, then you can have them. But you don't need them. People can find it via the web, via search, via social, whatever, whatever way they find stuff. If you do want to have that additional exposure, um, for example, Microsoft will bring progressive web apps into the Microsoft Store. And they'll bring it either in via um, Bing Spider finding progressive web apps. That's what they call passive ingestion of progressive web apps. Or you can submit your progressive web app directly to the Microsoft Store. When you do that, when somebody installs the progressive web app via the Microsoft Store, um, you could progressively enhance that progressive web app to add on features and capabilities that are only available through something that's been installed via the store. And that's because stuff that's been installed via the store is more trusted. Um, so you get access to additional features. Um, and I think you'll see similar things happen with other app stores. For example, with Google, you can use the trusted web activity um, to wrap a progressive web app. Um, and uh, when you go and look at the trusted web activity, it's not apparent immediately that this is something that's PWA related. 
but it actually is something that you can use for PWAs, and I think in a lot of ways was designed for PWAs. Um, so basically what it does is it wraps it in sort of a native wrapper. Um, it's akin to, <laughs> just a, Jason Miller described it as a built, basically a built-in version of PhoneGap for Android. Um, much faster, built into the platform. But the other piece that it does is that it establishes a trusted relationship between that application and the website that the application is, is housing and vice versa. And what that will probably mean in the long run is that Google will start to be able to expose more communication between those platforms, right? Because now we know that, they, that the person who owns the website also owns the app. And it's not, say, some random app developer um, you know, creating a, a wrapper around Bank of America's website and trying to capture all of the things that people are entering, right? Like in this scenario with the trusted web activity, we actually have trust between the two, um, between that, that website and that application. So we, we know that those, that those things should be able to pass information back and forth. And of course, if you want to be in the app stores generally, you could wrap your progressive web app using PhoneGap, using Cordova, the open source version of PhoneGap. Um, so this is a way to gain that app store exposure if you need it or to gain access to native capabilities if for some reason you need to add those additionally into your application. Um, but remember, like the progressive web app is your website. So all of the normal you know, search engine marketing tools, social tools, like all of the things that we use to promote websites generally are the same things that would work for a progressive web app. Um, in many ways, those will probably be more effective than simply being in the App Store, since App Store install numbers keep crashing. Um, so there are people who build progressive web apps who don't actually want them to install. We worked with an e-commerce company who um, was experimenting with progressive web apps, and they wanted us to make sure that people would not be prompted to install their progressive web app. Um, they did it, one, because it was still an experiment, and two, because they knew that when they actually got to the point of actually launching their PWA and sort of having it be something that they publicly talked about, they needed to talk to their support people about the fact that there would be a progressive web app and a native app and how to distinguish between the two, and they didn't have the time to go through that support training process. Um, and then on the other end, you've got people who want to be in app stores for whatever reason they want to be in those native app stores and then do work to make that happen. All right, the third thing is offline mode. And this is the thing that makes progressive web apps really powerful, right? The ability to cache things. So we can do a very bare minimum of this. We could cache content for performance reasons, common assets, um, common uh, application logic, um, and then provide an offline fallback. Um, those offline fallback pages can be more fun. So Trivago actually has this nice example of a maze where if you're offline, um, they will provide you with uh, something that you can do in the meantime. And that what they found is that 67% of people who are offline will return to the site. Um, you know, provide them with something to keep them entertained. They might be entertained for that you know, little bit where the train goes through a tunnel. We can then get progressively more complex. So for our site, what we did was we actually say, hey, if you, we didn't know what people would want to have available offline, so we basically just cache things as people interact with our website. Once they're offline, we provide a, a banner that says you're offline. If you go to a web page that you've been to previously, you can view the content. If you go to a page that you haven't been to, you can't. <laughs> Simple. Um, we tend to think of things as either offline or online, and that's actually not the real world, especially when we've got pages that are sort of downloading bits of content as the user interacts with them. I think Trivago does a really good job of this. So you could have a full page, and maybe you've downloaded um, reviews, and then you select for that particular hotel, you select a different tab, but now you've gone into that tunnel and you no longer have network connectivity. They show within that tab an indicator that you're offline now. Um, so that you can sort of continue to interface and interact with the portions of the page that it already had downloaded. The key in all of these is to make sure that we give users control and choice. We communicate with them what's happening, um, particularly because we've got people who are on um, you know, metered connections or who have um, limited data plans. Maybe they actually have devices with little storage. Um, so, when you do something like the Financial Times where you cache, pre-cache content and photos and the application, 
you want to give people the control to turn those things off. So those are sort of simple use cases or, or progressively more complex use cases. And even with the simplest ones, if you're not dealing with sort of cache management and cache invalidation, like there's work to be done to make that transition happen. But now we get into some stuff that's powerful that we've never been able to do before, like the ability to have background sync. Um, in this demonstration, there's an article um, that uh, the user starts to try to download. The network connection is really slow. And so the application asks, hey, do you want us to download this in the background? So the person says yes. They close the browser. Sometime later, the browser just continues to do its work. Sometime later, they receive a notification that says, hey, that article that you wanted to download is available. Now, this is a pretty simple use case, probably not something that would make a lot of sense. But you can see how background activity actually would be really useful, particularly if you need to queue up events to send later. Like maybe you've got a chat application and, and you want to be able to, um, to make sure that those messages actually get pushed to the server when the person is connected in the future. Um, at minimum, we should make sure that uh, if somebody is offline, we can now detect that they're offline. We should maybe like, let them know, maybe disallow editing. Uh, Slack does this in their application, which I think is a really interesting um, like, and sort of bare minimum version of what we could do with this capability for allowing offline editing. Um, because what it prevents is it prevents um, stuff like this from my friend Remy, who is in a hospital trying to write a blog post and ended up losing all of his work. Right? In the past on the web, we had no way to prevent this. Right, if somebody started filling out something in a web form, like my past experience was is that I would always copy that into a text editor just to make sure that I didn't lose what I was working on. Now, as a web developer, we should be able to detect this, prevent this, and help our users out. So again, we've got a version of using offline that's simply using it for caching to actually doing something really complex, like maybe allowing for offline distributed editing of the same document which is a hard, hard computer science problem. Um, maybe that's not where you start with your PWAs, right? But, but that, is, that is the continuum when we talk about what it means to do something offline, from something that's really simple to something that's complex. All right, the fourth one, push notifications. This is interesting, because if you're doing front-end development, push notifications is actually fairly easy, particularly if you decide to use like a push notification service. If you're not building out all your push notifications manually, if you're going to use something like Urban Airship or OneSignal or those types of services that provide a lot of that inner, um, a lot of that tubing for you, um, it can actually be relatively easy to get up and going with uh, push notifications. But they've got a lot of hidden challenges, um, and those hidden challenges aren't in the front end, in the JavaScript, in the HTML, those pieces. Um, it's actually about like how do we make push notifications effective. So we know that, that we, studies show that there's three times higher conversion for personalized notifications, which means that we have to not just send push notifications blanketly to everybody, but we have to know who they are. We have to know, like, hey, this person's interested in this type of information, these types of news events, um, these types of sports scores, and we're going to send them notifications that are personalized for them which means integrating it into some sort of user profiles and understanding what that person is, where their interests are, and making sure that they're connected to other more complex systems. Um, Slack posted this flowchart that shows how they decide whether or not to send a notification. And this has been a little while, so I'm sure that it is more complex than this at this point in time. Yes, yeah. Um, and the point isn't that, like, that people should copy Slack's flowchart. I mean, this is Slack's flowchart. Your flowchart is going to be different. The point is, is that it is complex, right? It is going to take some time, if you want to do push notifications well, to integrate it with other services. Now, if you already have a native application that's doing push notifications, um, it can be easier because maybe a lot of that logic already exists and you can leverage it. But we should make sure that we don't just like hop immediately to implement push notifications just because we have that capability. Um, push notifications have been around for a while. Users know what to expect from them. They know how they feel about them. And they're annoyed. <laughs> People are annoyed by push notifications. 
Um, so if we're going to do this, we need to do it in a way that, that increases the likelihood that people will find them useful. Um, because there is tremendous power in being able to have somebody re-engage with a progressive web app. Um, one of the ways that we can show them respect is to not immediately ask for permission when they visit our website. Like how many people now are encountering this on a regular basis? You hit a web page and it's like, hey, let us send push notifications. Like, no, it's like, it's like going on a first date and asking somebody for their hand in marriage. Like, can we just like get to know each other a little bit first? Come on. So don't do this. Don't do what YouTube does or did. I don't know that they're doing it anymore, but I'm like even the big sites are like doing this. This is crazy making. Um, when we implemented push notifications on our site, we're like, okay, we think that this is a really neat feature, but it's not the most important thing. The most important thing that people come to our site for is for the articles. So at the very end of an article, if you find the content interesting, we ask you, and you press a button, and then the browser prompt asks you if you want to say yes, and then if you do do that, we say thank you and welcome, and then you can turn it off in the same interface. Twitter does a really good job of this as well, Twitter Lite. So if you go to the notifications tab, um, they're like, hey, do you want to turn on notifications? And only after you say yes, does it actually use the browser prompt to say, yes, I want to use notifications, or no, I want to, don't want to. Um, and then they provide a little banner at the bottom that says the notifications have been enabled, and there's a button there to customize how the notifications are, um, are going to work for that particular user. And this is really important because browsers have implemented kill switches. So if, if a user decides to turn off notifications using the browser's version of turning them off, as opposed to say your controls for customizing notifications or your controls for turning them off, you will never get to communicate with that user again about push notifications. You're blocked. Um, and I mentioned earlier this change that we're seeing between um, these modals for asking for permission, where it used to be that there was this ability to either tap on other parts of the screen or to tap the X and disregard the prompt, what Google found was that 90% of users were dismissing the modal without making a choice. They were either um, tapping on that X or tapping on the rest of the screen and not making a choice about whether they wanted to allow whatever the permission request was, whether it was geolocation or, or push notifications or whatever. And so as of last year, I think it was like um, early in 2019 or late 20, or early in 2018 or late 2017, they changed so that now basically there is no option. You either block or allow a request. And when this happens, like the user like if they have not been primed to say yes, if they've not been told why you want that permission and agree that the reason that you want that permission is a valid reason for them, they will block you and that's game over. You never get a chance to ask again. Push notifications are not required for something to be a progressive web app. So a version of a progressive web app could have no push notifications. It could have completely complex push notifications that are all integrated, like that's the continuum for those. The fifth area is kind of my kitchen sink of PWA features, <laughs> like the kitchen junk drawer where everything gets stuffed into, um, because these are things that are actually not technically part of PWAs, but that people oftentimes lump into the conversation with PWAs. Things like AMP. Um, so AMP pages, much faster pages. Um, people are building AMP pages because they help them in search engine rankings. Um, I have some opinions about AMP that aren't terribly positive, but you know, like if Google says jump, you gotta ask how high, right? So, um, so if you do do AMP, there's some great features to allow you to actually install your service worker as part of that AMP process and make sure that the transition from the AMP to the PWA is as smooth as possible, right? You should take advantage of those. Um, there's also some really neat things happening with like the credential management API, um, which I'm going to demonstrate using our good friends, oops, um, is the video working? Was it working? Okay, I didn't see it on my screen. So ah, Pinterest is using it, thank you. Um, so you know, like I can go and open the Pinterest PWA and like just instantaneously, I'm automatically logged in using the credentials that I used previously. Um, and not only that, but um, I'm really, really excited uh, the next, the research that I'm doing now and the, the talks that I'm giving this year are all about WebAuthN, 
which might actually allow us to eliminate passwords entirely. Um, so this, this sort of functionality is available. As a matter of fact, like, there are so many things now available on the web that people think aren't possible. Um, I keep reading articles about PWA, and they'll talk about how you can't use geolocation, which has been around since 2009, I think, uh, or you can't use a camera. Instagram has a PWA. I think that they can use the camera. Or they'll say stuff like, hey, like you can't use the fingerprint scanner. But we have access to the fingerprint scanner using the payment request API, depending on the device. As a matter of fact, the fingerprint scanner is so easy that, um, that I bought these socks that I'm wearing on accident. Um, so I was, on, I was trying to write for the book, and um, I was trying to take a screenshot, and I forgot that the iPhone that I had at the time, that the way I took a screenshot was actually the same thing as the fingerprint scanner. And so I'm like, why is it not taking a, a screenshot? And then I realized that I had actually just bought the socks. Um, <laughs> so I would primed everything to take a photo for the book. Um, fortunately, these are the socks. Um, I really, uh, I, they're cute, they're groundhogs. Um, my son was born on Groundhog's Day, so like, I'm, it's not that big of a deal that I accidentally bought them. Um, but then I had to go take a new screenshot, and like, I was trying my pinky and trying all these different variations to try to take a screenshot without actually buying something. Um, so we have access to capabilities on these devices and on the web that we don't commonly think we do. So again, basic PWA with none of this stuff, and then stuff with a more complex one. So finally, as you start looking at this, I get really excited about progressive web apps because we don't have to wait till the end to do that. When we built our progressive web app, um, we started, we knew that we were gonna do it, so as we did a redesign, we relaunched with HTTPS, then we added a service worker and a fallback page. A little while after that, we added the ability to have offline pages, um, an offline indicator. Um, we were also doing performance improvements along the way, and then we added push notifications, and then like a few weeks later, when I got off my lazy butt, I wrote a blog post saying, hey, like, we've got the PWA, awesome. But we keep making improvements. And each step along the way, we were delivering something of value to users. So when I think about building a progressive web app, I think about the same sort of blueprint working for other organizations. So starting by defining what that ideal progressive web app could be. And depending on sort of what your organization is, where you end up on these can differ. So for example, if you've got a website that's an e-commerce site, maybe you want it to feel a lot like an app because you think it'll make a difference, but you don't care about installation because you've got a native application. Maybe you don't want to cache too many things offline because prices change, but push notifications, that would be killer, so you're going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, and then payment request API and, and credential management would make a big difference. So you want to make sure that those things matter. So like depending on the organization, how complex it is on these factors will change. Whatever you do, benchmark what you're doing and measure so that as you make these implementations, you can sort of brag about them internally and get buy-in from other folks. Once you move past that, that planning and definition stuff, then you need to assess if there's any technical debt that you need to address. Um, and you need to be honest about your current site. Um, in particular, asking two questions, like is your website reasonably fast? Uh, we've had clients who come to us with uh, websites that take 30 seconds to download on fast 3G, and no matter what we do with a service worker, we will not be able to address that. Um, service workers only impact the second page load because they get installed at the end of the first page load, which means that if your site is really, really slow, installing a service worker is not going to make it faster for that first page. Um, and then the second thing is, like, is it usable? Do you have a decent design that works cross-device? Um, the same client who had a 30-second page load also had a responsive design that had sort of been sort of grafted together over uh, quite a bit of time and was um, the touch targets were too small. So you address those items, and then maybe you go build like a baseline progressive web app where you do the sorts of things that, um, you know, like adding the manifest file, doing some service workers for performance, adding an offline fallback. Then I like to think about sort of what are the front end additions that you could do that don't require sort of working with a bunch of different teams but might be isolated to one team within your organization. Um, and then once you've proven those things, then you can start taking on the larger initiatives like implementing things that interact with um, sort of checkout and interact with push notifications and backend systems. 
The great thing about this is that as you lay out that plan, you don't have to wait till the very end to bundle everything up in a binary like you do with the native application and ship it via an app store and wait for approval. Instead, every place, you're actually delivering value. Like once you're out of the planning stage, you can actually make changes that improve your site all along that roadmap. So every step to a PWA makes sense on its own. If you haven't started yet, I really encourage you to go do that. Um, we have access, to, you are getting a copy of the book. It goes into much more detail about this stuff. Um, Aaron already mentioned PWA stats. Take a look at that. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. Um, I think we're gonna actually hold questions just because we're, we're running a little bit behind and I wanna make sure we get through our morning stuff and we'll have, Jason will be around all day, so yeah. we'll, uh, we'll loop you back in for, uh, for questions uh, in a little bit because I wanna try and get us back on track sure. here, but thank you so much, Jason, Sorry. that was awesome. Um, okay, so our next talk is actually gonna be by uh, Diego Gonzalez uh, from the Samsung team, so I'm gonna invite Diego to come up here and, uh, and plug in. Um, so he is a developer advocate for Samsung, working on immersive web experiences. Um, there should be, oops. Oh, the, oh, Biff. oh, Mike. Yeah. Oh, shoot. Here, I'll just hand you this. Oh, there's the Thank HTML. You. Sorry, technical difficulties. All right, yeah, we, we see it, so you can go ahead and okay. present. Great, Great. So, uh, thank you, Diego. Thank you very much. Bye, Jason. Okay, great introduction uh, to PWAs. Um, I'm gonna be talking here about some upcoming technologies and some of the things that, that we are including in the upcoming versions of uh, Samsung Internet, and I, they're actually in release, that might be even a tipping point uh, towards the PWA experience. So I think it's, it's definitely quite interesting. So um, just a bit about myself. I'm a senior developer advocate at Samsung, and I'm a Google developer expert in web technologies, focused, uh, as Aaron said, in immersive web. Um, not exactly PWA, but it's quite interesting when you start combining these two technologies and bringing different aspects of the web platform to it. Um, a brief overview of what Samsung Internet is. Samsung Internet is the company's web browser. It's the default browser for, uh, for Galaxy devices, and uh, you don't have to have a Samsung device to install it. You can pretty much use it on any phone that's running Android L or higher. It is an evergreen browser, so this means that we keep it up to date with the latest and greatest web technologies, and uh, hence why I'm here today, which uh, is PWA. Um, it's Chromium-based, and the latest version is 9.2, which would be an M67. So the reason why I'm talking here a bit about Samsung Internet before starting is because we generally tend to have a quite a big market share and, and lots of um, uh, active users. So if we see it here in the United States, uh, we are around a 6% of uh, users. Um, there's a lot of people, if you go to Europe, uh, North America in general, it's, it's a lot of people. So again, just make sure that you are testing your applications accordingly, your web experiences accordingly. But now to the main topic and we can take this possibly as an update from the Samsung platform team uh, regarding what's going on with PWAs and the technologies that are coming. 
when we start thinking about why would we want to target an app specifically, and, and Jason mentioned some of these before, um, we're talking, first of all, uh, you know, as developers, business owners, and people that we have a, a product or a service, we actually want to have some interaction and some engagement. This generally is associated to an app, because if we have this interaction, this engagement, then the customers and the users will keep on coming back to our experience. We want our experiences to be easy to find. They should be easy to discover. And if this application generally means that you're going to have to download, we need to be very conscious on the size of these applications and the experiences that we are asking from the users to download. When we think about applications themselves, there are generally some quantitative proof that apps are or tend to be better than websites. And we can you know, just think about the fact that 80% of a user's time it's spent on applications. Uh, mobile versus desktop usage is still on the rise. They generally tend to be associated with great snappy UI. They're fast, they're very responsive. They have access to device hardware and sensors, so camera, immersive devices, uh, geolocation, et cetera, et cetera. They have a easy way to implement notifications, which means that it's an easy way to keep the user coming back to the application itself. And of course, they work offline. Now, 71% um, of the world is still in 2 and 2G and 3G connections. So, uh, and, and even if we go to places like London, if you're already in the tube, then it's going to be quite hard there to get connection. So. This is kind of like the idea of why would we, would we be pursuing an app. And it turns out that we already can combine this notion of the application and the web. So we just got a great uh, deep dive into PWA in the session before this one. I'm just going to cover kind of like a different aspect to it. If we think about the web, um, Jason already mentioned uh, how it could be progressive and how progressive web apps are not only enhancing to the different devices and the different screens where we want to enjoy these applications, but also how they can be fast and how they should be focused on being really snappy. Offlining with uh, catching and service worker, it's pretty much already a uh, done deal. And we get access to an icon on the home screen. But then again, those are not all the characteristics that we want or that a user associates with an application. And if we look at this from the other perspective, comparing to an app, on a platform level, they're not talking about PWAs. They're not necessarily there exactly as a first class citizen. And I'm just going to go through the user experience on getting a PWA into a home screen. So in this case, this is Firefox, latest version of mobile Firefox. You get the, uh, this pop-up that's actually telling you what the Add to Home Screen button indicator is doing. Um, you continue to the website. You click the Add to Home Screen, and you get this kind of banner. This banner is telling you, you know, add it to the home screen. So you go on, and you add it to the home screen. And you get this uh, kind of icon, which you should drag and drop or just place Add. And then you get the small icon that you're getting right over here. So um, that's how, how it works in Firefox. If we move on to uh, current version of Microsoft Edge. So a very similar experience. You get uh, this application, Progressive Web App. You're getting a small banner that says Add Bubble to the home screen. You press here, and you're getting the exact same user experience for it to be added. And we can see in the last screen and in the last um, screenshot how we get the uh, icon with the small internet uh, logo in it. Now, while it is getting the job done, there are some key differences from this to the way that a user is experiencing the final applications. First of all, you will not find this in the application drawer. When you go and you check the list of your applications, you will see that it is not listed there. Second, it's not listed in the systems app. So you can go to the settings. You will be browsing to possibly get uh, more detailed settings per the application. You're going to see that it's not there. You cannot manage notifications in a granular way. 
you won't find it in the share menu. Uh, if you get a notification, let's say a Twitter notification that's coming to the PWA, you're going to see that the brand, and this, this kind of varies depending on, on the browser vendor. Um, it used to be the case that you would be getting just a notification from, in this case, Samsung Internet instead of Twitter, and that could be confusing for the user. And the whole point that you would be getting this browser badge uh, over the icon itself was a bit confusing. Why, for an end user, why do I have two different applications here that are called the same, but they kind of have this weird identifier? It wasn't really um, that clear. So what I'm going to be talking about today is basically Web APK and how this helps solve some of these problems. The idea behind Web APK is that the browser now has a service that will generate and install an APK into the phone. And it comes with all the advantages of having the app itself. The way that it will be managing the updating of the app is whenever you launch the application, it will detect if there's a change in the manifest. If there is a change in the manifest, then uh, it will proceed to re-download all the application. Um, some tricks, if let's say you you want to see the icon changing, uh, you might have to change the file name just in case it doesn't update it so it would cache it again. Web APK also allows uh, and supports Android intent filters and this is quite interesting because it's a way that you will be able to manage URLs that you might want to kind of keep uh, scoped outside of the application. So let's say that you might have uh, PWA that has the core experience for your, your application itself and you can leave um, you can scope all the help, support, and these type of other experiences towards uh, launching the browser when you're uh, uh, online. Uh, important to actually mention that uh, what uh, cookies, permissions, and the state of the browser is shared between the PWA and the browser that's running the PWA in, in the back. And of course, you're going to get the permission and storage management. So, We've seen how Firefox, Edge, um, were doing the Add to Home screen. I'm going to just put an example of how uh, a browser like Samsung Internet that is implementing Web APK would change this experience itself. You're going to go to um, the same experience. So in this case, we have uh, bubble.pictures. This is a PWA. This is actually a combination of uh, WebXR. So it's using WebGL, WebXR, uh, PWA. Um, you're going to click the Add to Home screen, and once you click the Add to Home screen, uh, that's it. It installed the application. Now, I put the other two screenshots so you can get an idea of what the user would be seeing, because you get a notification. And this notification is, is quite fast. Uh, it's telling you, in this case, that the, you can see in the screenshot in the, middle, in the middle, it's telling you that it's installing. Once it finished downloading and caching, then it will tell you, it'll give you a notification from the browser because the browser is the one that's installing the application and generating the APK, saying that Bubble, or the PWA, is installed. Now, the benefits that you get from this combination is that you are going to be able to find the application in the app drawer, and you actually can see their Bubble uh, listed in the, in the app list. When you go into notifications and you check uh, the application section, you're going to see that it's also listed there, and we can see it there in the middle. And if you tap on it, you get granular uh, information of settings for this application itself. So we can see how we can have different notifications, we can have different permissions, and we can get information of uh, battery and storage management as well. Now, talking about the update just as an example, um, today at 4.55 in the morning, I realized that the Twitter application um, updated. I realized because I was checking Twitter, I opened the PWA, and I got this notification. Again, the browser was telling me that it re, um, re cache re-downloaded uh, Twitter, and it was updated uh, pretty much instantly. Now, uh, the benefits that you're getting is pretty much that you're getting badging, and you're getting the notification badging that is even consistent across several devices. So if you're using if you're using a, uh, for example, a smartwatch, you will get, instead of it branded as the browser, which used to be the case, you're now getting it branded as Mastodon, as Twitter, and you're going to be able to even respond from the notification on Android. So to quickly give a demo of how this works, I'm just going to install the PWA. I'm going to remove here the video. Uh, 
OK. Um, are we getting any feed from this? The phone? OK, cool. So uh, I'm going to open the browser. In the browser, I am going to go to the PWA. PWA is loaded. Uh, once we have the PWA, let me see. Must be something missing because I'm not getting the add to home screen. Okay. So let me just try with the other phone quickly. Okay. Well, apparently, uh, I'm having some technical difficulties with the, with the uh, demo. But basically, once you get this, uh, it should prompt the Add to Home screen. You click the Add to Home screen. And what I wanted to show you is uh, the, the notification when it downloaded, it installed it, and then going into the settings. So you can see the, um, the settings. Anyway, um, that was a quick recap on what we believe is a tipping point. Uh, for PWAs from the Samsung Internet team. So uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, all right, we're going to, again, save questions until a little bit later. But thank you very much, Diego. And uh, now I'm going to invite up uh, Jeff Bertoft, who's one of my colleagues from Microsoft. Um, and he is uh, a principal PM at Microsoft, has been in charge of a lot of great PWA efforts, um, including PWA Builder, if any of you are familiar with that. We'll actually be talking a little bit about that a little bit later. Um, but Jeff is actually going to be talking to you a bit more about uh, the Microsoft perspective as well as what it means to be a desktop PWA because a lot of the focus with PWA discussions has been around uh, PWAs as a mobile experience. Um, so he's going to talk about the desktop perspective as well as what it means to be a PWA in an app store and um, maybe around how, how that would be a value or potentially not a value. Um, and so we'll, we'll actually have a, a little bit of this discussion in this one as well. OK. OK, yeah, yeah. Um, also, if, if you do have questions kind of in the interim and you want to put them, put them somewhere so you don't forget them until our discussion point, please feel free to drop those into either uh, Twitter or into the Slack channel. Um, and we will collect those and discuss those a little bit later. All right? Um, so for those who couldn't hear that, Justin just said we're also monitor monitoring the live stream chat as well. Um, to gather questions from there too, and we'll we'll bring those back. So, without further ado, Jeff Bertoft. Try that again. There we go. You know, I almost wore the same shirt as Jason today. I'm really glad I didn't. You know, the twins thing wouldn't be able to tell us apart. It could be really confusing who's speaking. But um, you know, I think it's standard plaid shirt for speaking, anyways. Uh, so I'm Jeff Bertoff from Microsoft, and I want to give you a little bit of a perspective um, f of how we look at progressive web apps at Microsoft. And so I want to start by taking you just back through history a little bit as to how we got where we are today. So um, way, way back when, um, about what, seven, eight years ago, around the time Microsoft started um, building out Windows 8 um, and using the web as one of the platforms for building applications. At that time, we had things like Cordova, where we were building uh, web apps or native apps out of web, web technologies. We didn't really know what to call them. Um, we had things like WebOS, where you could go and build a application with your skills as a web developer. And you know, all of these ideas where you're building using your skills on all these different platforms, 
they were going to come together and you were going to be able to write once and run everywhere and that's exactly what didn't happen. Instead, the next generation, we kind of went to this idea of hosted web apps, which was a little bit better in the sense that we're now building in the browser, right? We're, we're running our code on the server instead of popping it onto in a package and shipping it like we do native apps. Um, so there was a lot of improvements there. We're not only just using our skills, but we're also reusing a lot of code that we're sharing with the, um, the, the folks who are visiting our websites in the browser. But we're still doing it multiple ways. And I kind of had to dig through the, the, the archives to get some of these images. But remember the Chrome App Store and the Firefox OS Store and the Windows Store? You know, at the time, um, I was running an open source project called Manifold.js. And it was manifold, it was many things going into one because the idea is we were taking the W3C standard manifest and trying to translate it into all of the different platforms that web developers were trying to build with. Well, luckily at some point we, we as, a, as a community got together and said, you know, we need to fix this. We don't want to have all of these different divergence anymore. And it's kind of where we are today. Um, as Jason said, there's not a real clear definition for what a progressive web app is today. It means different things to different people. But one of the things I think is universal is that we only want to write our code once. We want that code to run everywhere. We don't want to have to write different versions of our web apps for different platforms. So at Microsoft, we are fully behind that. We want PWAs to be a first-class platform. We want our users to love progressive web apps. And part of that is we don't even want them to know that they're using a progressive web app. We think they should just be using an app. And so we're continuing to um, innovate with some of the changes that we've brought with um, uh, the announcements we've made about Edge Next to um, more unify the platform and bring web even more to the forefront of the application development stack. We want those users to have a app-like experience with all the benefits of running something from the web. Now when we go out and we talk with developers, we, we often use a slide that looks something like this. You know, this is the, the cost benefit analysis for a progressive web app. Um, the first thing is, is that um, you're building with the technologies and the, that, that you have. You're reusing your code and your frameworks and your analytics and all the things that you have set up for the web today are the same technologies that you're going to use to build your PWA. Um, we also then throw in there for um, a lot of the, the, the Microsoft developers that you don't need to write C Sharp to build an app, which might not be um, a, a huge deal at, at first thought, but finding JavaScript developers, especially in this city, is a pretty easy thing to do. So if I'm writing for an app like Windows or desktop apps in general, finding a JavaScript developer to do it is a lot easier than finding a C Sharp developer. Uh, we then talk about deploy, because the old the old management system of um, deploying to the store, having some third party approve it, and then have that um, going into the mark market um, is significantly more difficult than what we do for the web today, where we control the entire pipeline. We um, deploy it to our web servers. We have ways of getting the code out of our repos and onto the web servers, um, and it just goes out there whenever the code is ready. Um, the next step is about publishing. We tell them, hey, you can publish your PWA and have listings the same places that um, their users are out there looking for the native apps. And the key here is that um, you don't have to build twice. You don't have to build your native app and your PWA. Your PWA can be your native app. 
Well, that's one of the areas that um, is really expanding for us at Microsoft now. So when we talk about publishing apps, in the past, PWAs have been delivered through the App Store. The mechanism for discovery was a store app. It was a familiar way for users to discover applications. But there was a bit of a, um, a challenge for us as developers, as web developers and progressive web app developers, because as Jason mentioned, one of the benefits of PWAs is that there's no app store that you need to use. You have the freedom to publish it and control your app distribution all when you're on, not needing to go through a store. So one of the things that um, we're really interested in getting feedback on at this point as we make these decisions is how do we build a progressive web app that works both ways? So from a store perspective, as I mentioned, stores are familiar for users. It's a discovery mechanism that's tried and tested on desktops. We know that we can put something in a store and users know they can go to the store to find trusted applications. We have mechanisms now like the trusted web activities that allow us to take our PWAs without having to do any changes to it and running it as a native app and submitting it through the store without really having to give up and sacrifice the principles of a PWA. And of course, the ability to have more discovery mechanisms is always better for us as a developer. But on the other side of that, there's continuity with the browser that you miss when you're only going through a store. If I'm on the Twitter website today and I want to install the PWA, having to go to the store to do it when I could instead have it installed immediately and then continue my session where I am is a huge benefit. Having the context, um, not only the context of that session, but the context of having the same cookies and the same extensions available to the user as they have in the browser is a huge benefit for them. And you know, it also means that we aren't requiring developers to go through the walled gardens of the app stores. So there's not necessarily a um, gated community that you need to get into. If you're doing rev share, you don't have to split your income uh, with someone who is handling that distribution for you. So there's a lot of benefit on both sides of the fence there. And so one of our goals in the next couple months is figuring out how to make both of those work at once. Have a mechanism where you can go through a store and get that, that discovery experience, that traditional experience for apps, but at the same time be able to make that discovery in the browser and find that same app with that same experience that works the same way for the users. Um, as uh, Aaron mentioned, PWA Builder is one of the, the um, projects that I work on now. And um, we're in the, the midst of going to PWA version 2.0 right now. Uh, Justin's gonna talk a lot more about it later. But um, one of the things that we're continuing to focus on is um, making sure that you take that first step of publishing to the web. We're gonna provide you the, the, the manifest and the service workers and the things that you need to build a PWA. And then step one is getting it out there on, that web, on the web, making it discoverable via the browser. But at the same time, providing mechanisms for us as developers to go through and be able to build the packages necessary for things like um, the, the Microsoft Store. There's platforms like the Xbox where app discovery in the browser is very difficult. Uh, discovery through the store is very easy. So we need a mechanism as a PWA developer to be able to be discovered on the Xbox. We wanna make sure there's mechanisms to be able to support platforms who are allowing you to take that extra step of moving into the store while not sacrificing the, the um, open web aspect of PWAs. One of the other things that is, um, is, is broadening our horizons at Microsoft is the fact that we're now moving Edge further than we ever have before. 
So a few years back when we launched Edge, it was on Windows with Windows 10, and we would always give you the latest version of Edge with the latest version of Windows 10. And so the folks who were using the latest version of um, Windows had Edge, and then if they were on older versions, they had older versions of Edge. If they were on Windows 8 or Windows 7, they had Internet Explorer, and so we weren't really bringing all of the customers forward. Well, with um, the Edge Next initiative that we have, and I think Aaron will talk a little bit more about this, we're now not only um, running on Windows 10 and all the versions of Windows 10, but Windows 8 and Windows 7 and Mac as well. And so from our perspective, understanding how to build a PWA that works on mobile and works on desktop can follow you around as a user when you're using that same uh, Edge browser on different platforms. Um, again, something that we're, we're, we're very open to getting developer feedback on how we can make that um, experience best for your users. Now, um, if you haven't seen it already, the uh, developer channel of the Edge browser has launched this morning. So if you haven't had a chance um, to see that yet, I encourage you to go to the uh, Microsoft Edge Insiders website, which is microsoftedgeinsider.com, and uh, sign up, download it, uh, give it a try. You can play with some of our early implementations of PWAs as they run in the, the, the browser there and get a glimpse at um, some of the, 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 the infrastructure that we're building out today for PWAs. Um, and I look forward to getting more feedback as we get into our Q&A section. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Moving into more rapid fire sessions here. Um, all right, so our, uh, our next speaker is going to be Felix, who is hiding out over there, pretending not to know that he's going to come up on stage. Um, I'm particularly interested in, uh, in hearing Felix's talk because um, Felix works at Slack, which has been kind of one of the, uh, the flagship, thank you, Jeff, uh, one of the flagship Electron programs for a long time. And in many ways, Electron was sort of created to do the things that the web was not able to do, do that deeper integration with the system and, and allow something to behave uh, more like a native application. Um, and so PWA is coming along and trying to offer some of that same stuff natively in the web has, uh, has created kind of an interesting challenger for Electron. And so yeah, I'm super excited to hear what, uh, what Felix has to say with regard to PWAs because the fact that Slack is even working on a PWA is, is news to me, so I'm, I'm particularly excited about that. Just keep dropping things. Thank you. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Felix. I'm senior staff engineer at Slack and the co-maintainer of Electron. And I've been working on Slack's desktop apps for a long time now, still do. And my talk is very briefly, essentially, about how does Electron think about PWAs, right? Or more specifically, how do I think about PWAs as we um, go deeper into the rabbit hole of like trying to turn websites into actual applications, right? That's sort of what we're trying to do here. And um, what I usually like to do before I even start talking about Electron is that I motivate a little bit where Electron is even coming from, historically speaking. Because I do feel like that JavaScript on the desktop is often a little bit like CGI. Um, it annoys people whenever they notice it, but I have this very strong suspicion that most people are barely aware about how much JavaScript is actually running, not even on the desktop, but on their very own machines. Um, 
And I have a few like examples that I like. Spotify is an easy one, um, but probably also one that at least some developers know about, right? Spotify being like one of the very first companies that ended up building desktop applications in JavaScript. But um, one that I particularly really like is the user interface in Battlefield 1, which is a React and MobX application, like the little ammunition counter. Um, and that's one of my favorite examples because um, I think we as web developers have done a pretty good job of figuring out how to present information in an effective way and how to organize that presentation uh, of information in an effective way. And I think the React model is really speaking to a bunch of developers across languages. And um, this is a nice example for me because obviously our friends at DICE know how to build native code. They're pretty good at it when it comes to C++ development. The folks at DICE are pretty damn good and they still chose React um, for the user interface because uh, it has certain advantages for them that um, you cannot find in other frameworks. Um, so Battlefield 1 is one. And um, if you go one step further, if any of you run a Windows machine, if you have an NVIDIA GPU, you likely have seen the NVIDIA GeForce Experience, which comes with Node.js. So this is one step further. They also have some HTML in the actual application, but this is one step further because um, if you think about Battlefield 1 as losing, using some React to present information, the NVIDIA GeForce experience goes ahead and uses Node.js to orchestrate various interactions with other applications and with the operating system and to basically make um, bindings against drivers fairly straightforward. That's what they use Node.js for. Um, it's a renamed binary, but it runs on every single machine that is also running the NVIDIA GeForce experience. And if you combine those two pieces together, you end up with something that Adobe has done, and they've been doing this for many years now. It's, uh, the Adobe Creative Suite runs both Node.js and um, what used to be libchromium content, the Chrome content module, and they combine that together into their plugin infrastructure. So every single time you run Photoshop or Lightroom or Adobe Premiere, you're once again booting up Node.js, which powers uh, cross-platform interaction with the operating system. And if you take all those pieces, um, you essentially end up with what today is Electron, right? There's like an idea of combining Node.js and Chrome and turning that into one combined module, which gives you cross-platform desktop abilities, right? And um, one thing that I think we talked about the fact that like apps mean different things to everyone. I think another thing that means different things to everyone is what actually cross-platform means or what a desktop app is. Um, whenever I talk about Electron, you know, people in both camps have reactions about it, both web developers who are very familiar with JavaScript as well as native developers who are unfamiliar with JavaScript. Um, one interesting piece about the whole Electron story is that it's, yes, these apps contain mostly JavaScript, but it's primarily actually about the notion of writing native code, um, which is really the big differentiator between Electron and all the other components, uh, is that I can write native code, right? There's absolutely nothing in user land that Electron can't call. Um, I, you can write C++, you can write Objective-C, and we at Slack, for instance, do that pretty heavily. Um, you saw the notifications flowchart. That was just a backend flowchart. We have an equally big one on the client. We were just trying to figure out what is going on on your machine. And something very simple like, is your machine currently in Do Not Disturb? It's extremely difficult to do if you're not a native app. If you are a native app, it's one line of code. Um, it's pretty straightforward in both on Windows and Mac OS. Um, but in both cases, you need to talk to, uh, on Mac OS, you need to talk to actually core app, app and on Windows, you need to actually call WinAPI. Um, figure out whether or not you do not disturb, for instance, with WinRT is basically impossible. It's just not really doable, um, even though it's just one line of code in actual user mode code. And that's really what Electron is about, right? It's this notion of I can run code. So cross-platform for Electron means that we're trying to target all the desktop, um, all the desktops, and it's essentially the Chrome content module plus Node.js, plus a pretty thick layer of C++, and that's where Electron comes in, right? So it's, uh, <laughs> it's this bundle of these two really popular modules, but we also smear this like thick layer of C++ around it, just a bunch of uh, C++ APIs for common operating system operations, just so that you don't have to write the code. Uh, there's really no major difference between the C++ that we write or the C++ that you would write as a native Node add-on, but it's, operations like which folder are you currently in? Show this, show this file in, 
Explorer or Finder or whatever the equivalent on Linux is on the currently running system. It's uh, something as simple as not deleting a file but moving it to the recycle bin. If any of you are running Visual Studio Code, every single time you uh, delete a file, um, that was one of the first things we did uh, for like where we took Electron and made some adjustments for Visual Studio Code was this notion of moving stuff into the recycle bin instead of just deleting it. So <laughs> things are a little bit better now. But those are, those are just common C++ operations that Electron offers for you. And in our case, cross-platform is this idea of uh, building a solid experience for desktops, right? So in Electron's case, mobile isn't really necessarily a scenario that we support. Um, it probably won't be for a really long time for all kinds of reasons, but the primary one is that um, Electron is a little bit more in the software side rather than the website. And that's, I think, something I'm going to try to explain right now, which is that at some point we had websites, as we all know, right? We had our little blogs, and those were HTML files. And then we gained a little bit of JavaScript. Sorry. Then we gained a little bit of JavaScript, and we could start building web apps that had some kind of interactive experience. And now we're trying to extend that model into progressive web apps, right, that go beyond that scope. But the one thing that is really the big differentiator between PWS and Electron, and that's sort of where, where my thinking comes in, is that progressive web apps sort of are pretty far away from being a user mode application, right? And in my mind, that comes with a lot of benefits. Um, it also comes with the cost, but it also comes with a lot of benefits. Um, an Electron application is an actual user mode application. It's not something that's running in your browser. It's the browser. There's absolutely no difference between there's absolutely no difference between Notepad, Microsoft Office, Photoshop, and an Electron app. They live with the same rights, um, but also the same requirements, right? And then obviously we have the Aura mode ring, the uh, kernel mode ring. But uh, the way I see it. Any progressive web application contains some kind of web application. Any web application contains some kind of website. And Electron is pretty well suited to hosting a PWA, right? And that's sort of the tack we're going to take at Stack. We're currently in the process of rewriting uh, the actual web client. And that web client is available on the website, where you will also probably eventually get it as a PWA. But we will run most of the same code in our desktop client, which will be an Electron application. And if you think about the actual cost that is associated with that, um, there's, there's a little bit of cost associated with PWAs. Um, there's one thing that still sort of like half me stop short of saying we don't really need something like Electron, and that is this notion that every now and then I talk, talk to people um, at Google and like, you know, with my friends here at Microsoft, we talk every now and then, and at some point someone asks me, okay, what kind of API do you need um, so that PWAs become like the thing and you don't need a desktop application anymore. And my answer is a wild card, right? Electron doesn't force me to make that decision. If Apple releases a new gimmick tomorrow, like a new touch bar or a new spotlight integration, I can just call that. There's absolutely no need for me to wait for someone. There's no list of APIs that I need to choose with Electron. It's all of them, like every single one. There's nothing in user mode that I can't call. And what that means for me in practice is there's absolutely nothing my product managers can come up with that I can't build, right? Like I might need to learn a little bit more Objective-C and um, the macOS APIs might be terrible, but all of this is like definitely extremely possible. There's like no, no, there's no limit here. At the same time, and we had this like at the beginning with browsers a little bit, right? At the same time, this power comes with real cost. It doesn't just come with responsibility, but it comes with real cost, right? And those are things like updating. Um, one of the biggest issues I have in my life is updating software. Updating desktop software is extremely difficult. And updating website is extremely easy. At least the world where I'm from, you just deploy the new version to the server, and then eventually everyone will get it. Um, that's a slightly different story if you have actual desktop applications. Sorry. There we go. Um, the other cost is, of course, security, right? Um, since PWAs inherit their powers by the browser, they might be limited by the browser, but that also means that you have to think less about how you keep your content in check. One of the things I need to worry about is if you see a YouTube video on Slack, I need to make sure that that YouTube video can't do anything to your machine that you don't want it to do your machine, right? That's like a thought I need to have, at least in the back of my head. There's like this notion of I need to build my own security garden to make sure that all this content is in check. And 
Then lastly, it's the performance and size notion, right? Electron applications will likely never get dramatically smaller than 40 megabytes. That's just the reality where we are. Um, and once they are on disk, beyond that, electron applications will always have a decent amount of overhead. Um, we can get the memory usage down to about 20 megs, but running Node.js and your own, own instance of Chrome does have some cost, right? So that is also something that PWAs sort of has, have as a leg up. This is something I'm really, really excited about. There are things I'm really excited about PWAs, and they're sort of all about not necessarily what you can build, but much more about how it facilitates building in the first place, right? Like difficulties that I think we in the desktop world had a really, really hard time overcoming and probably won't overcome for a while. I don't really see updating get easier anytime soon, to be entirely honest with you. Um, we've all been trying to do this for a while now, and I think Google has actually done a really good job with a project called Omaha, which updates Chrome itself, um, but beyond that, it gets a little tricky. The one thing the one thing that I would like to see more is for PWAs, though, to basically build on those strengths a little bit, right? I mentioned installing and updating, and one of the things that kills me right now is that um, when I need to explain to a company how they get a PWA, I need to ask so many questions first. Which operating system are you running? What kind of browser do you have? Which version of that browser? Oh, it's Windows 10, but the first version of Windows 10? Can you install Chrome? Is that possible? Those are discussions that are extremely difficult, there's like no one step to PWA installation. The same way that I can send you select.exe, and I don't care which version you're running of Windows, if it's Windows 7 through 10, any version, it will work just fine, and to know exactly how it's gonna work, that's kinda nice, right? That's, there's some benefit here. Um, if I needed to explain to my parents how to get a PWA today, that would actually be pretty difficult for me. It would be like a multi-step process. I can just send them Slack today. It's just a thing that they double click and then it opens. There's no step in the middle um, that makes this a little easier. And um, at the same time, at the same time, one thing that I'm thinking about the, the more time I spend in this industry is that for years now, I've been trying to convince people that cross-platform means, oh, you go to the console and then you go to the desktop and then you go to the phone. Um, that is something I spent my time at Microsoft on for years, and to this day, I've yet to see an application that truly like captures all those devices with one code base. I now think it won't exist. I don't think we can build a great application that runs the same way on a game console with a gamepad, on a big computer, you know, like think Surface Studio, and on a phone. I, I don't really think we're gonna get there. Um, what I am excited about is this notion that it's still really, really hard to build one application that runs on Windows 7 and Windows 10, or to make it even easier, Windows 10, the first release, and Windows 10, the current release, that is still really difficult. And it remains really difficult with a PWA, right? Um, but long story short, I think the way I think about PWAs and Electron is that they're not necessarily competing. I don't think they will compete. Um, the way I see PWAs are just more powerful web applications, and that's good, and that's great. And what I tell people these days is, if you can't think of a reason why you should have your own desktop software, you probably don't need it. Just build a PWA, and once you bump against the boundaries of where you live, once you bump against any kind of boundary, and there could be something as simple as you need file system access, but it could also be something more affirmal, like you need, your enterprise sales team needs a file they can just double click and then it installs. Until you need that, it's probably fine if you just build a PWA, um, because there's a real cost associated that comes with all the additional power. Yeah, and that's about it from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felix. Um, so I think we have a little bit of time before lunch is here, yes? Um, so we can probably open it up uh, to kind of general questions for uh, the speakers that you've heard from before, but actually before we get to that, uh, Diego just reminded me. Um, Diego figured out what was wrong with his demo, so if you wanna come up, he wants to show you the, uh, the phone demo again. I'll just, just let you go from the hand mic if that works. So I'd be very, very sad if you all leave and think that a web APK doesn't work. So um, I have an update on web APK on stage gate. So it turns out that when 
Let me just connect here. And let me know if you're getting uh, cloning. Okay. So um, it turns out that when you already have the, the web APK generated, then it doesn't generate it again. So it's kind of like good because then it avoids you having to uh, repeat. And that's why it was not showing the, the icon. So uh, in here, we're going to go back to bubble.pictures. Okay, there we can see that we got the icon at the home screen. Um, I'm going to click on this icon so you can see how the process goes. Uh, just remove this notification. Uh, you can see there that I'm getting the notification uh, from, from Samsung Internet, the browser. It says that it's installing. Uh, it's installed now, so now I can just close this. Nope go to the application and I have it here. Now, um, if I go here to the settings, uh, okay, applications, then let me see, let me see, let me see. There we have bubble and I'm getting here all the information. So basically, um, it's the way it's meant to be working. If you already have installed it, uh, you should install it again. Um, maybe it was a valuable lesson to put kind of like a small message, you know, uh, this is already installed, but uh, it's a new feature. Uh, we're still uh, working on it and uh, yeah, thank you very much. Web, AP Web APK works and uh, it's not broken. Thank you. All right, Diego, I'm actually gonna have you stick around up here and I'm gonna invite the other speakers back up on stage for uh, Q&A before lunch, if that works for everybody. Justin, do we have some, some questions yet from the live stream? Okay. All right, we'll let everybody get up here and then get some questions from the audience. Hopefully, I'll have them. If not, we'll just take a, a bathroom break before lunch. All right, open it up to you. Questions, thoughts? Oh, we have one question from the thing. Jeff will get you. It's not on. All right, there we go. Um, so yeah, the question was for uh, Jason. So um, push notifications, it's actually really uh, interesting questions. So you can, like the user can block push notifications like from like Chrome or their browser. Um, but someone was asking, is there like any way that like the developer can know that they've been blocked or and then maybe if they are unblocked they can they can ask again um, and there is there any like kind of quotas on that or anything that you know of I I know that they can't ask again um, I don't think you know um, I I don't remember I know there are some APIs where it actually does tell you you can inspect whether you have that permission or not or it will just it'll return false uh, like I know like lo local storage for instance <laughs> Uh, it'll return false if the user hasn't granted permission. I do know that, um, I forget who it was I was talking to, but somebody was running into issues with push notifications. You mentioned limits. Um, there are some providers, um, some browser makers that actually limit the number of push notifications that you can send during the course of a day um, to like 20. So if you're a service like say Twitter, for instance, that might be a problem if you have a particularly popular Twitter account. Um, but that's not something you really have any introspection into that I'm aware of right now in terms of tooling. And I also know that um, like the first time you ask like uh, permissions for the notifications, it will return like a string. I think it's like declined or something like that if they block it. Um, so you can use that to kind of say, okay, I've been blocked. I'm pretty sure at least that works. Um, I, it's worked in Chrome before on Android. Um, but like I don't think there is any event that you can get um, that will tell you after you like yeah, been unblocked if, or something. If the person can... went into their settings and blocked yeah. it later, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know, I haven't tested that. Cool. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I would also be curious, because uh, I don't know the innards of the, the push notification spec, but when the blocking happens in the browser, does the browser inform the endpoint that would be sending the permissions that they have unsubscribed? Um, or is it basically pushing into oblivion? I don't know, I would hope it would unsubscribe them, but. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? From the room, anyone? Yeah, right there. 
with a push button. Hi, I'm Chuck from Reddit again. Uh, just wondering if you guys seen any uh, previous studies or research about the trade-offs between a PWA and native app. You know, you mentioned that you can make a PWA essentially almost native, uh, but then that trade-off is you don't get as much native installs, right? I don't know, Jeff, do you want to? Yeah, we, we actually, since we've, we have store telemetry and we have browser telemetry, um, what we've heard from a number of our partners is that they're different customers. So um, if those who are going through the store and discovering their native apps, um, that was the gateway that they were going to find the brand. Meanwhile, it's a different audience um, that is coming through the web. So we even see that from a native perspective as far as installing a native app through the store versus installing a native app from a website, like when Spotify does the, you know, install from the website or install from the store. Yeah, they're different customer sets. So when they introduced the store, it didn't actually erode what was coming into their website. And so I would anticipate PWAs being the same. And of course, that'll, that'll change depending on the the, the particular um, site and everything, but um, you know what the data we've seen is that they're often different customer bases. I typically, uh, I am really tired of the native versus web debate. Like, I think I talked about more of sort of native stuff in my talk than I probably typically do because I, I tend to avoid, like I just, I, I find it typically, I find it frustrating, right? Like it's been going on forever. Um, there's going to be cases where organizations need both. Um, if I start talking to an organization about PWAs with the idea that they might replace native, then you've got like a, an entrenched group of people who have, an, have a stake in PWAs not succeeding. And I just don't care that much. Like I want the web to be better. And so I tend to focus on like, um, what are the reasons why no matter, even if you have a native application, you should have a PWA. Um, and that's because you're gonna reach people who you can't reach via your native application. Um, and then everything else just makes sense. Um, as far as studies are concerned, Google at the Chrome Dev Summit last um, November uh, had a study from, I think it was Expedia. I can't remember which company it was, but they talked about how they had fears that having a PWA was going to actually decrease their app installs, and actually they saw an increase in native app installs after rolling out PWA stuff. But I can't remember if it was Expedia, or if it, I can look it up. Yeah. I've got, it's one of the things that I need to add to PWA stats and haven't got to yet. So it's in my, it's in my list, so grab me later. Felix, do you wanna add anything about trade-offs between the two? Yeah, so I think, I think Slack might be a little bit unique because it's so much more an application than it is anything you would ever Google for, right? There's nothing on slack.com that you would find via Google. We just don't have anything. Um, the vast majority of our customers are in our native app, the desktop application. And I can tell you, just personally speaking, that I really strongly believe in the web as a very powerful tool. And that I also really very, very much believe in um, the escape hatch of having the browser, right? So. Maybe speaking as someone where, the, and I know this is not the case for most, for most companies that are interested in PWAs, I assume for Reddit, for instance, that most of your users are probably on the web. I'm just guessing that, I'm just making that up. But um, on Slack, it's very much the inverse. Like the, really, the vast majority of people come in via the application, and that's what they run all day. Super excited about PWAs, and also super excited about the web as a platform to build Slack specifically. So um, I don't, yeah, that's, that's also what I was sort of trying to say with my talk is that I don't really think there's a competition here going on. Um, it's more like an ever-expanding set of, you know, like. Crisis. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, the Kindle didn't actually kill the book. It just also, you know, made a bunch of people read. Um, and maybe that's fine. I mean, I think some of the trade-offs that you see between this is it's it's kind of, you've got that that continuum from like the, ubiquity of the web and the, the great distribution model that the web has that anybody can get to, you know, any page on a site at a URL. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum, kind of on the, the native and hybrid web native area, you've got a lot more control. You're also closer to the metal if you need better performance for image editing and, and stuff like that, something that's a little bit more uh, intensive um, that you want to be closer to the CPU. That's where that starts to be really 
uh, attractive and, and maybe a better option. Um, you've also got trade-offs in terms of file size. So um, I know uh, Charlie will be talking about the, the Twitter PWA, but they had a massive file size drop going from their native version to their PWA in the Windows Store. Um, just massive, massive drop because you're not shipping all of the, the code to render it. It's all part of the browser that's in the system. And in the case of Slack, I mean, they're shipping the browser every time they're sending an update to the, the Slack uh, binary, right? Um, and they also have to deal with the security updates for that and all, all of that sort of stuff and you have to kind of stay on top of, of that as a, a model. So that's another thing to think about when you're, when you're considering kind of web in native or, or kind of that hybrid approach versus straight up web PWA aspect too. I, just on this, this idea of, um, I, I think we tend to, to think about this idea of, of um, the size of the application as being a constraint that, that might not apply in the United States. We worked with a very large um, e-commerce retailer, and they have people who, um, and they, they told me this story, like I, it wasn't a prompted story, like we were just interviewing a bunch of people talking about projects unrelated to PWAs, and they were telling us the story about how um, once a month people spend a lot of time in their store in a really long queue, really long line. And they had implemented some stuff in their native application that would allow somebody to skip that line and go to like, cause they'd enter in a bunch of data and just like go to the fast line where there was nobody waiting. They couldn't get people to install the app and they couldn't figure out why. So they went to the store, put people, basically offered people, hey, you can go on Wi-Fi, you can install this app, you can skip this line that you're in and go over there and do it. And the reaction from people in that store was, well, is there a website that we can use? I don't want to install an app. Now, these people were also people like this was related to like um, paycheck caching sort of scenario. So they were people who were probably on more mid-tier devices, um, people with storage constraints, and were probably making a choice between installing that 100 meg native app and photos of their grandchildren, right? And when that's the case, like they will choose photos of their family over your application. And that was Midwest United States, like not another country, like not. So I think we have too much of a perception that that's just an issue for other countries. It's actually an issue here as well. We very much live in a bubble. To uh, um, add a bit on, on, on that, uh, I've seen a similar case uh, in an experience that we built for um, a, a museum, a fashion tech exhibition in Paris where you had uh, a lot of people that would have to queue to actually use the uh, web, the immersive web experience that was running on a machine uh, with an Oculus. And uh, we also had the option of, you know, just uh, go to this URL and you'll be immediately uh, in the experience. So people were actually taking their phones and, and instead of actually waiting in the queue, they were using it. So I think that's uh, a similar trade-off, yeah. We had a question over here. We get a mic down there. Yeah, related to the, the download size that you were mentioning, a lot of, some of the apps are coming out now with like light versions of their, their native app, like, they, like for example, Facebook Lite, Instagram Lite, Twitter Lite, and a lot of them are essentially like a packaged version of the PWA. Um, what are your thoughts on that, like moving forward, like is that a viable thing, like is that, yeah, just open. To go on that one. Well, I, I'll start it off. I, I think that um, part of the persona of being a web developer is, you know, using whatever tools you have to reach whatever goals you have. And so if you're able to take your PWA and uh, build it into an experience that helps users who, um, you know, are constrained from using your native app, then um, I don't see any any issue with it. I think that uh, if it works, then we should support it. And I think that the scenarios that people are using PWAs in should help drive the roadmap of where it goes. Yeah. Can we have somebody from Twitter here? Yeah. Yeah. Charlie will be talking a bit about, about Twitter stuff later this afternoon after lunch. Um, one, one bit I will note is that in the web, we actually are starting to get some really rich APIs to be able to tell if people are bandwidth constricted and, and such. Um, so we have the network information API, which is getting going. It's, it's not fantastic yet, but it's getting there. Um, you also have the save data 
header, which uh, can be submitted by a browser. And you can actually listen for those in your service worker and intercept things like image requests and then maybe load a placeholder image instead or something like that. Um, and so you can really have that light version without having a separate light version. You just have that logic built into, um, built into your system and you just make the, the default experience as, you know, best performance as, as possible, as Jason was talking about. You want that first run to be super quick, um, but then once the service worker is in place, it can go ahead and manage all of those requests and determine whether you want to show you know, a low bandwidth version of an image or no image at all. Um, yeah, those sorts of things. You can also allow people to decide what they want to save offline too. That's another uh, interesting pattern because th even though the service worker acts as a man in the middle between the network requests and the, the cache API, you can actually access the cache API directly from JavaScript outside of a service worker too. Um, so you can allow users to be in control of what actually gets cached offline, which is pretty cool as well. Uh, I'll share one criticism I have heard um, ab about that approach is that um, PWAs are also powerful tools and can be used to not just do lighter, simpler experiences. And I think there's a, a bit of a you know concern that the consumers will look at PWAs and say, oh well, that's the uh, that's the light experience. Um, meanwhile, there are some people um, you know like uh, Pinterest who are doing like incredibly rich experiences on their PWA and Twitter as well, who are doing incredibly rich experiences and. Um, it potentially could get overlooked if it just gets categorized as the light approach. All right. Other questions? I think we're just about ready for uh, for lunch. Yamila. Sorry. Um, one, one of the uh, questions that I often get from my partners, especially media partners, is like PWAs are not suited for uh, my application media is not it's content rich it's in, in its performance, and especially if you can make a notice of uh, how PWAs run on different platforms, specif specifically on Microsoft like Xbox, and what is applicability there? Thank you. Okay, so I'm a part of a, I've been part of a working group, um, the Wave Working Group, which is a media consortium who are looking at web as a way to build um, applications in the platform for different platforms like smart TVs and Xboxes and PlayStations. Um, and I can tell you, what one of the things that we've been identified is that it's a fantastic opportunity, but there's a lot of gaps that we still have today. And so whenever we are talking with media partners, um, we've seen some amazing media apps out there, like Hulu is one of them that has just a fantastic experience on their, their PWA. Um, but doing some of the things like storing DRM content offline for Playback later is still a real challenge. And as service workers, is, it's just getting started. You know, as far as being able to uh, cache and trust content um, in, the, in the cache API and, um, you know, applying scenarios like DRM to it um, is um, with things that we still haven't figured out yet. So it's... It's not to the point where I would say that it's right for every scenario. Um, there's people in the media space who are doing fantastic jobs, but they're also telling us about the gaps that they see and what they can do with that PWA today. So this, I, I guess I don't quite understand. Like, uh, so smart TVs for quite some time, like we're almost all the app platforms were web-based platforms, right? Like Samsung's. Um, SDKs were all doing web-based stuff. Um, Nintendo's was for quite some time. Apple was like the only one that released with any sort of native, like only way of building stuff. So like that's been around for a while and Netflix was shipping WebKit and like that was basically the way that they shipped all these different platforms was actually bundling WebKit into their system. So it seems like it seems like that's not a problem. Is it really just a DRM question for these companies? So there's a lot of um, deeper uh, concerns to think about. One is the idea of that we don't have yet today is to build once, run everywhere, right? So like, for example, the W3C manifest is not actually honored as the manifest for each of the different markets and everything. Um, so there's still alliances that need to happen to be able to make a right once build anywhere. Um, there's also 
and I, I, I couldn't be careful about presenting this, but like if you think about a smart TV and how often it gets updated, it's not near as much as an Xbox or a Nintendo. So there's really this gap between this is a um, always up to date getting uh, security fixes and new features type of platform that a web developer can build on top of. And then here's a frozen in time um, shift with the, the box scenario. So low specs often. Right, right. So part of the, um, part of the consortium's efforts is to, to solve that aspect as well so that we have a way to keep an evergreen model on devices like that um, to, to, to kind of make a, a constant API surface for web developers. And then of course, you know, as more and more uh, media providers want to have offline versions of songs and movies, we run up against the browser limits for storage, uh, which is something that we're, we're looking to address. Uh, how much insight do any of you have into um, Apple's motivations or lack thereof um, for supporting PWAs given their sort of where they stand with their app store and the value they derive from that? No comment. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so, the, uh, like most people, you don't have, you don't know, right, entirely. Um, the conversations that I've had have been focused on specific features, right? So, um, and like the App Store portion of it has almost never come up when I've had conversations with at, with folks who app, at Apple who do stuff, right? Like, um, there the conversation I remember a conversation I was having about push notifications, and they have push notifications on desktop, but they don't have them on iOS. And the main reason they don't have them on iOS seems to be that they're concerned about the user experience and people already complaining about too many push notifications. And so their technology is already there. They could do it on iOS pretty easily, but they're concerned about the user experience. That isn't a conversation about the App Store or the revenue associated with the App Store. Um, I, don't, I don't think that that's part of the calculus, but you can't tell for certain, right? Um, service workers, they were resistant for a while, but they've done that. Um, the web share API, like, like I didn't even know that they were talking about it and it shipped. So I think that it's, um, I, don't, I don't know that I would like infer necessarily nefarious results, but who knows, like it's all a black box, right? Like um, the conversations, like if, I think it's much better to just talk about and like, like hammer them on the things that you want to see and not worry about why they may resist it. Yeah, I, I would second that. I, you know, there's, uh, it, it seems to me, every time that we sit down and have a conversation to, with them, um, the, the, the feeling that I get is that it's, it's thoughtful. Like the, the actions that they're making is, it's based on the research and it's, it, we often look at Apple and think, okay, App Store, you know, and it's kind of the, almost looked at as the anti-web type of scenario. But, um, I, you know, in, in essence, I think that they just make thoughtful decisions and they wait for technology to be tested before they put it out there. Um, I've got full confidence that they're on their way to delivering you know, full PWA support. I think they're gonna do it in their time and they're gonna do it when they feel the technology is safe for their users and easy to present in a way that their, their average users will understand it. But I'm, I think it's just a matter of time. I mean, it could also be argued that being able to have a viable alternative to the App Store could um, help them with, you know, some legal proceedings and things of that nature. Yeah, and I think one thing I'll just add kind of from, from our experience on our store side, like stores kind of struggle with they have their own policies around what can and can't be in the store based on like if you purchase anything like you know this has kind of been a famous thing with the the play store and with the uh, app store like you have to give apple a cut which is why you can't buy a kindle book right from the the kindle app on on ios um, and we struggle with the same thing in the microsoft store where you know we we want our pound of flesh for you being in the store um, and i think we're trying to like as 
as companies that have app stores and want to embrace the web and PWA, we're trying to look for ways around those policies or, or we're trying to push the stores to embrace the web more um, and such. So I think things will change in the future and I'm sure Apple's struggling with the same things that we've been struggling with for the last couple of years in terms of dealing with store, store and web and trying to find a way to get them to play happily together. Any other questions? Should we adjourn for lunch? Yeah? Okay, I think we've got uh, an hour for lunch. Is that right, Milo? Yeah, yeah. One, one hour for lunch. All right, and uh, we'll all be here, so you can feel free to hit us up individually. And again, you can always post questions if you don't feel like raising your hand on the Slack chat or via Twitter, and we'll, we'll catch them and, and read them out as well. All right, thank you.
So we have some, some cards to swap on the cameras for the live stream, but now is a great time to use the bathroom or get some coffee or do whatever you need to do before we settle in for the uh, afternoon.
live stream. So, all right. So we're gonna get back into things here uh, with an afternoon of, uh, of stories from the trenches and hopefully some some inspiration for the future and a bit more uh, discussion. But we're gonna kick things off with Charlie Kroom from Twitter, um, who I've had the the great pleasure of working with for gosh, almost two years now. It seems like. Uh, as I, I first tried to coax him to bring t the Twitter PWA to the, the Microsoft Store to replace the, uh, the old native app. Um, but he's gonna be talking to us a bit about their journey with PWA and uh, how things have been going. And last time I saw this talk, I got a lot of really awesome stuff out of it. So uh, give it up for Charlie. Thank you. Hey everyone. As Aaron mentioned, my name is Charlie, and I'm one of the tech leads working on the Twitter web client, and here to talk to you a bit about our PWA, what we've been doing over the past couple years, uh, some of the Microsoft stuff. I'll babble for a bit and then leave it open to some questions. So if you all want to learn anything or ask anything, let me know. Uh, and I want to start by saying that I had a pretty crazy weekend. I went skiing in Salt Lake, visited some friends, got engaged, and somewhere in there, th thank you. <laughs> Somewhere in there I made this presentation uh, and I spent all this time doing it. I walked in here this morning and I realized I basically just copied Jason's presentation. So it goes to show something, something. Uh, it's good because people are aligned. So you'll get to hear a little bit about it from the Twitter perspective. So what I'll cover is uh, where we're at on the PWA today, just in case you don't use it or haven't heard about it, give you some information on it, and then I'll talk about what I think uh, makes a good PWA. And then I'll go into talking about our next step for our PWA, which is bringing it to desktop. So we're gonna be changing all of our users over. All of the web users will be on one code base. It's a crazy thing, and I'll talk to you a bit about how we got there. So we've also shared a bit in the past about this. Um, previously at IO and 17, we presented on our mobile website, which was one of the first steps we took towards working on this PWA. Um, there's a lot about the features we built into it there. We talked at Build in 2018 about bringing it to the Microsoft Store. And I'll go over a little bit of that, a little bit of that again as well. Um, and there's also a lot of cool eng blogs, and we're actually working on a bunch right now as well. So if you want to check out any of those, um, you can visit the Twitter developer blog. But for today, I'm going to talk about something that we've been uh, experimenting on for the past few months, which is the PWA and building it for desktop. So as a brief background, technically, we have our old website, uh, twitter.com for most of you. It was made in 2011 or so, combination of front-end and back-end overhauls. It uses Flight.js, Mustache, some boring stuff. Uh, you might recognize it from some of the screenshots in Jason's presentation. But now we're using a new website, which is the PWA. It's built on React, Redux, Node. Uh, a lot of the stuff you've come to know and love, but the most important thing is it uses a component-based design. And I think this was the biggest thing we shot for when doing this. And it's actually not talked about a lot, I think, in progressive web development because it's so, uh, it's not part of the technical stack. So one of the things that doing this helps us with is it allows us to move faster and to be able to develop more quickly. And it's probably the most important piece of the PWA, and it's not even a technology we talk about. It's just a concept of how we design it and how we split things up. It allows us to do bundle splitting so that we can progressively download code as people visit each different page. We can make sure we're getting the right code to the right people. And the other thing that's really interesting about it is it allows us to do some cool stuff with progressive enhancements as well. So right now, uh, in conjunction with this component-based design, the PWA and sort of this single code base approach is designed to allow us to scale. And we have this thing we talk about uh, internally called Twitter scale. What does that really mean? There's a lot of websites that are large. So I like to think of it as being really efficient. We actually have surprisingly few developers for how many people use the site. And I think this is one of the great pieces of PWAs. They can multiply the, in fact, the impact that one engineer has on updating Twitter in all kinds of different situations. So uh, you may have heard of KaiOS. It's one of the biggest operating systems in a lot of the developing markets that Twitter cares about. They have really small 240 by 320 phones. You've got to remember to even test screens that small. But they approached us, and uh, we're interested in bringing Twitter to the KaiOS store. And when we first hear about that, it might shock a lot of you, it sounds like a lot of effort to go out and actually develop a whole new app for this, this KaiOS device. Like, is it even going to pay off? It's high risk as a company to do these types of things. And at the same time, you can imagine one of these users. These phones don't have touch screens. They don't actually have a lot of ways to get around, and they're not easy to use. They have T9 typing. You remember that from texting people in like 2000? It's not easy to do. Um, so using the PWA doesn't seem like it would be easy. 
But on KaiOS, we can actually feature detect this, and we can progressively enhance it by adding what's called a soft bar. So it's that little black thing you might not even have noticed in the bottom of the screen that says new tweet on it. And this can provide extra shortcuts or easier actions to navigate around the site because you can do it with two of those soft keys. We can actually take advantage of those little extra keys. And it's one of the easiest things, I think, uh, of progressive enhancement to understand both as a consumer, a user who might want to make a new tweet, and a developer who has to go and implement this. And going back to the component-based design, on Twitter it maps very nicely to one of our patterns. We have this floating action button that we use on mobile. And this component is a variety of purposes. It's uh, composing a tweet or DM, creating a list, replying to a tweet. We use it on a few different pages. But it's a single component because we're using this component-based design. And that means that throughout the entire site, when we want to go support KaiOS, we make one change in one place to render this as a soft action bar. And it'll convert all of our actions into this style. So this illustrates why progressive enhancement and PWAs fit so well together. It's really easy to sort of do that type of thing. And let's talk about Windows. If you're here, you probably know the Windows story already. Uh, about a half a year went by after we expanded the character limit. We switched from 140 characters to 280 characters, one of the biggest changes ever made at Twitter. And six months after that change, the Windows app still was stuck on 140 characters. Imagine a first-party app that your company put out doesn't have its flagship new features. That's embarrassing, and it took a lot of expertise and resources to actually keep up with our old Windows native client. So by switching this to a PWA, it allowed us to passively provide a number of new features to our users, like 280 characters, and we could use those extra few incremental resources we had to focus on progressive enhancements or differentiators specific to Windows. So once we had the basic features, we sort of built in some native enhancements to the Windows platform. And up here you'll see the timeline, so if you visit a moment or an event on Twitter, you get an entry in the Windows timeline, so you can jump back to it, follow up on that match you were watching or you checked out. And uh, there's a few other enhancements as well here, so we have the tiling menu, you can see my wonderful fiance there featured prominently, you can actually pin users that you care about to get quick access to them. You can use jump lists to easily go in and get to different places within Twitter with a single click. And of course you can share. It's one of the biggest things people do on the Windows app. All of these help give the app a native and immersive feel and provide shortcuts for common tasks. And they're not hard to do. These are very easy things. They take a couple of lines of code. But because we have a single code base, we only have to build the additional features for each platform. We don't have to go remake 280 character handling every time we put on a new app. It's really easy to feature detect and isolate this code as well so that we can keep it clean in the future. It's very easy to swap out the Windows code and put in some Android code or put in some KaiOS code uh, and only ship that code to those users. Okay. So this is a slide I've shown a while ago. Uh, I enhanced it a bit with some memification. Uh, I think I'm using that right. And it's something I've been shouting to anyone who will listen, is PWAs are a brand. It's something we're all here to learn about and enhance that brand. And slapping a manifest on a website and calling it a PWA is a travesty. It dilutes the brand for everyone, and I can't even start talking about the, the sites that just show push notification alerts right when you go to the site. It's infuriating. A quality PWA requires that your site is built with a variety of use cases and experiences in mind. And moreover, the entire team, from designers to developers to your PMs, have to understand the idea of what a PWA is and actively seek out use cases to leverage it through both design and technology. And you have to provide some of these enhancements to as many of your users as you can. So uh, I thought I was really cool with this slide, but I was shook by this tweet because last week someone uh, informed me that I actually don't work on a PWA um, because Twitter doesn't have offline support. So that was, that was news to me. Um, hot, edgy takes are fun on Twitter, aren't they? But it's not wrong, right? The, the basic premise here is that Twitter doesn't support offline for this person's use case, and it should. And it's a valid criticism. We've wanted offline support forever. But right now, with the tech at hand and the APIs at hand, we could show the old previously fetched content. And that's something that actually works if you're not on iOS. Um, I think they actually just fixed it in their newest release as well. But we don't think that reviewing old content is a core use case of Twitter. It's not what the product's about. The product's about live. It's about real time. Offline support might be more important for a podcast or audio or video streaming site where you want to take that with you on an airplane or something. 
And all this goes back to what Jason talked about. Instead of focusing our efforts there, we focus our efforts where we can be differentiated and where I would advise all of you to do the same thing. So you'll never see Twitter PWA behind on the share API. I can promise you that. I've been eagerly watching for the moment when we can receive photos and videos, and we'll be on that right away. And you can bet as soon as the context picker API is out, we'll be trying to help you find all your friends on Twitter. So these are things where our product and technology can overlap, and that's what we focus on. So let's talk about how you might start thinking about how some of these features make sense for your sites. Many people start with the major use cases, and that's desktop versus mobile, right? And this is what they might do. They might say desktop users have a big screen, a fast internet, and a mouse and keyboard, um, and you can't touch, right? You have like a normal screen. And on mobile, it's touch-centric. People swipe all the time. You've got flaky internet. You go on BART with it. And they're low-powered. You can't do a ton of processing. But I don't like this model. I think it's pretty old school. What if we think about each of these use cases independently? And I think this is what PWAs encourage us to do. And it's actually 2019. The text there, we can target these things. We can start to look at how the NetInfo API can tell us what the internet speed is. And we can use that to compress photos if they're on a low bandwidth network. We can add hooks into the operating system, like I showed earlier, for Windows. These are the types of enhancements that PWAs should be providing. And I wanted to throw this in. Uh, this is something that was talked about earlier, but one of the key features we added early on was a data saver mode. We knew our mobile website was targeting people who are network constrained. They have to pay for every megabyte of data. And so for us, saving this was a really important thing. And this parameter, the user's network condition, if you will, or data availability, was something we let them explicitly pick in the menu, but you can imagine that we queued this off the NetInfo API as well. Or if this gets built out a little bit more, we could queue it off whether it's a metered connection or not. So I view Data Saver as a key feature of something I'd call a big P PWA. And I can't stress enough, don't add a manifest file and call your thing a PWA. There's no standard for what it is, but I encourage you to embrace the idea. Make sites that respond to some of these parameters in tangible ways that relate to your core user experience. Most PWAs are designed to make subtle adjustments and respond to the user's environment. OK, so shifting gears a bit, why do we think that this PWA we've been working on that started as a mobile website is actually ready for a 27-inch desktop and the variety of users that come to Twitter.com every day? What did we do to react to these parameters? And I think this is, again, something that was talked about earlier. It's, we didn't do this all at once. It's been a long process, and we went through each of these steps. And it started as a mobile-only experiment, but we gathered feedback from there, and we tweaked it, and we added in features at every step. One thing we're at right now is we're in between this sort of native app and desktop logged in experience, which is the final step for us. And we've started letting people opt into the new site, and we receive feedback from them. And one of the advantages we had of being in the Microsoft Store and being able to sort of use this desktop user base we had already built up is that we're developing and experimenting with a new design right now that half of all of our Windows users have. So it's something that we can get feedback on and sort of incrementally learn from and build as we continue to move forward. This is why incremental development fits really well with progressive development, which I think was mentioned earlier. You can validate a little bit and move on. All right, so I talked about parameters and working them into your app, and I'm going to give you a rapid-fire little demonstration of some of the small details we added in, because a lot of people didn't notice some of the things that happened as we worked from mobile all the way up to desktop. One of the first things we realized is that we have a lot of screen real estate, and we want to be able to show related content and take advantage of that. So we started by inventing something called a sidebar layout component. And all this does is it shows the main screen, shown maybe on your right here, on the mobile device. Uh, it shows that alongside some related content. And it gives us a place to put rich content that isn't as important on narrow screens, but we have a lot of room for on desktop. Taking this one step further, we actually have a master detail component. And this can show two totally independent pages that we would show on mobile as uh, an inbox screen, and you'd click through to the detail screen side by side. And that allows people to get a really nice experience on desktop, where they have space to sort of manage that independently. If we look at something like an individual tweet, it might not seem like there's a lot of difference, but there's actually several subtle places it changed. So if you click to view one of these photos, you'd be taken to a photo gallery. And here you can see it shows up as a modal uh, instead of a full page screen like it does on mobile. This is a nice little difference. It's not as heavy of a navigation on desktop, so it makes people feel like they can get back more quickly. And even if you look at something subtle between these two, we actually change the way that you interact with the page. So on desktop, we'll show a little arrow to cue you that you need to click or use your keyboard to go to the next photo. On mobile, we don't do this because touch is really built into the way that people are used to interacting with it. They expect to be able to swipe. They don't need to be told that. 
even looking at how we interact with drop downs, if you were to click and get more information about a tweet, on mobile we have a sheet, right? That's pretty common interface pattern that people use. And on desktop, you'd expect that menu to be a little bit smaller and closer to where you click. So we present it as a drop down. And this is another example of a great component because it's actually one thing. The developer, when they go to make a menu, just puts the items in the menu and they don't care about how it's going to be presented. So it allows us to move really quickly and make fundamental changes that are very nice for the user. All right, so this is what we set out to do and what we continue to strive for. We want to make one app that provides a progressively enhanced experience to all of our users and all of our potential users too. We hope that this will help us reach more people. And I hope some of the things I've discussed here uh, inspires ideas for your products. And the path to this goal might be a little different than ours was, but I was trying to come up with sort of three steps I thought would loosely help and be useful to you. So one, map your users to params. Uh, if you aren't targeting data constrained users or connections, you don't expect to have those, then don't build data saver. It, do what fits your app. And two, determine the fit with product goals. This is what Jason mentioned. You don't have to invest in every single thing you've seen today. Every single feature that we did might not fit. Prioritize it like anything else you would. And it's okay to be good enough in some areas and really invest in others that are gonna make you special. Number three, find the right tool for the job. It might be that basic CSS or design are enough to get your experience to where you want it to be, or it might be a new API that you need, and you have to go ask browser vendors, like the people you see here today, about that to make sure that you can get the experience that you want. At the end of the day, PWAs are an incredible val incredibly valuable tool in our toolbox. They make it much faster, much easier, and much lighter weight to develop a site. So make sure you identify parameters to characterize your users and fit those in with your differentiators to strive to be a truly progressive web app. Think about where, how, and on what devices people are gonna come to visit you, and then create an app that gives the best possible experience to each of those users. So I didn't do this alone, of course. We have an entire web team at Twitter, and they've put a ton of love and effort into this PWA. We use it just like you do every day, and we're so excited to keep building it out. So thank you so much to everyone here for their tireless work, and thank you all for listening. Thank you, Charlie. Um, so I want to open it up for, for questions. I'm sure some of you who are either in the, in the trenches doing, uh, doing PWAs or considering it want to learn from, uh, from Twitter. So we'll start over here with the folks from Pinterest. Oh, can we get them a mic? Thanks, Chuck. Hello. So a uh, question with regard to sort of the transition um, from a mobile-only PWA to a mobile plus desktop. I was wondering if you encountered any challenges with regard to having like bundle size or like shipping extra code to support both like um, something on mobile and desktop. Yeah, I think that's a good question because it's easy to start with something and lose sight of that, right? right? We're still very focused on the bundle size and we've actually gone above and beyond. Paul Armstrong, one of the engineers, is working on developing a dashboard we actually use internally that allows us to see with every commit how much we've changed each bundle. And that can help us spot places where we accidentally bloated a bundle or celebrate places where we uh, trimmed something off of the main bundle or made it faster to boot. I think a lot of what we do here, um, some of these things like that sidebar layout, the code for the sidebar only loads and downloads when you're on desktop. So you'll see a spinner for that, and that's a sign that we're waiting to load it. It's not in the main content bundle. Um, code splitting is one of the most important ways to keep your site maintainable. I think we still have a little ways to go on how we use Webpack um, because it is easy to keep adding to this site. And we want to make sure that in the long haul, ideally, we don't add more to the we call it time to first tweet, which is the time until you see the first meaningful content, which is for us a tweet on the site. We want to make sure that that stays constant or goes down over time, even as we add more features and things like that. Is that helpful? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and I think just one, one thing to quickly add is that uh, Charlie talked about different platform features and stuff like that. With most of these, there is you know, a relatively easy way to determine if you're in a certain scenario. So for like the installed via the Windows Store, you can search for you know, is, is the window.windows .windows namespace there? And if it is, then you can lazy load in those additional features. So that way it allows you to, to drop them later on if you needed to. And that's actually what we do is a lot of the Microsoft code is around timeline handling or other things that no other platform needs. And so we only load those once we detect that it's actually a Microsoft app. Justin has a question. Um, yeah, so my question is, so 
How are you, so like the Windows stuff, so how do you decide to load Windows only code? Is it a client side thing or is it like a server side thing or? So our architecture is largely uh, entirely client side rendered right now. So it's a single page app that all runs on React. Um, we make very few decisions on the server side other than sort of internally at Twitter where to route things. Cool. So once the main client boots up, uh, we look to see if it's a Windows app, and if it is, then we load the Windows interface, which contains all these things like set up a timeline or set up the jump links or uh, handle the activate event that sort of sends and receives share events. Um, just kind of following on that just really quickly, and we'll get to you, Chuck. Um, I'm curious, uh, the folks from Pinterest and from Sling, if, if you have, if you guys are following a similar approach, is that, yes? Yeah. Nods in the room. Yes, nods in the room. All right, the check. Yeah, I was just curious um, why you chose to put it onto a separate uh, website domain for mobile.twitter.com. So the, it goes back to that progressive development style is we wanted to start with a, a small proof of concept. And for us, that was the mobile website. Uh, the previous mobile website, I don't know if anyone actually remembers it, it's been two years or so now, had, had fewer features and had a lot of the same issues that I mentioned with the Windows app where it was tough to keep up with, we got behind and it was hard to maintain. By starting with that, it allowed us to get a lot of feedback about the core experience. Did client-side rendering work? Um, did some of these design choices and design consistency work? So it was very clear for us to start on mobile.twitter.com. The thing you'll see soon, and I mentioned, is we're bringing it to desktop. And when I say that, I mean that all of Twitter.com will be using the progressive web app. And right now, I think uh, some percent of users can actually go and they'll get a thing on the side that says, hey, do you want to try the new Twitter layout or something to that effect? And that will change what Twitter.com, the domain, routes to for them. So we are looking to basically, in short, move it to all of Twitter.com as the domain. But it was a very easy way for people to opt in or out, especially pro developers like everyone in this room knows that if I want to get the PWI, I can always go to mobile.twitter.com. So it was a quick, quick and dirty fix for that. It's, a, it's an approach that's been used by, by companies kind of and organizations across the board. It was another way that people flew uh, responsive web design under the radar before that really took off. I mean, I remember the BBC worked on actually redoing all of their, their entire site as responsive only on the mobile site, so it was only at m.bbc, uh, or .uk, and e uk. Even if you're not making yeah. a mobile website, you could still do pwa.twitter.com or .yourdomain.com as well. Yeah. It's just a, it's a way of beta testing, basically. And, and politically let you fly under the radar if, if you've got people who are very, uh, uh, I don't know, hold on to that www really closely. <laughs> So if you're doing this like component model, obviously makes a lot of sense and um, it sounds like you're doing sort of feature detection at the component level that each individual component uh, knows how to render itself in different scenarios. Mm -hmm. So I assume that then that like you have a component which is a proxy for a number of different components that's like fetched lazily um, or is there some bundling where you're saying, okay, uh, for clients like this, we have a bundle built ahead of time consisting of the core components th that that um, platform would need or that set of features would need? Um, let me try and restate it and make sure I understand. How do we know that, how do we separate our bundles? Is it sort of at the, each component level or is it packaging those things together into, a, into a, a Windows bundle or an Android bundle? Okay, so a lot of the core code is just in main. It just works like it is. And we do a standard pattern where every screen tends to be a different bundle. And that's a good starting point for a lot of places. Um, and then from there, we use Webpack, so you can sort of, in a comment, put what you want the bundle name to be. And these can be the same bundle name in multiple places. So a lot of screens that relate to tweet details or once you click into a tweet, um, you can go in and see who liked it or who retweeted it or view the analytics. Those we actually package together um, because we think that if you access one, you're likely to access any of them. So that's where we manually make one bundle for all of them and we call it conversations. Um, you can do the same thing. We do have one entry point into the Microsoft code, and so it's very easy for that to just be the Microsoft bundle. But if we had that in multiple places, um, like iOS does, we could call that bundle the Microsoft bundle and put it in many different places, and Webpack would sort of roll it all into one bundle. 
So I'm curious how that plays with this idea of thinking about, not thinking about platforms as much as thinking about features. Because when you start thinking about features, then you end up with these like permutations of all the different combinations. And the alternative, right, is just like this water, giant waterfall where you can't fetch anything until you've fetched everything. Yeah. Um, with the Microsoft stuff in particular, I think with, with components, it's OK, because we just render a loading spinner until we get whatever piece it is. And you can do that all the way down. The search box you'll see is its own loading spinner, separate from the main um, layout of the app, because type ahead is so heavy and has so many specific things part of it. Um, the OS integrations are interesting, because a lot of that stuff can't wait um, for the bundle to load, or it needs to be there immediately. And so what, what we did there is we created an interface that has a default null interface, and then the code gets built out from there. So it does increment the main bundle a little bit, um, but it allows us in components to just say, hey, PWA interface dot timeline viewed. Um, and in Microsoft, that can do one thing. On KaiOS, that could do another thing. Uh, it only does something on Microsoft. But that allowed us to prevent having to sort of put a loader um, put some boilerplate code in every other place we wanted to use it. I don't know if that's the right thing to do. That's just an idea I had um, that, seemed, that seemed to be nice, because I agree with you. I think you don't want to care about all these things when you're down in a component level. So it's more of a notification when something happens, uh, independent of what operating system or what set of features you're running on. Thank you. Yeah. One more? We've got a couple over here. All right, I had one more question. Um, I was curious, w with regard to sort of the component design and supporting like multiple screens and things like that, um, did you guys run into any challenges with like, let's say a developer develops, adds a feature or something um, specifically, and they're thinking about desktop, but then they kind of forget to see how that experience is on mobile or other platforms? Yeah, and it, it's something I was thinking about during your question, too, as you mentioned, permutations. And I think it is something that is very risky. Um, we use browser stack, and it's hard to run every single browser we support and exercise every single feature that might be specific to one browser. Uh, testing that it works on A and not on B is a lot of overhead. I think the thing that happens more often is we develop something for mobile and forget to test it on desktop. And that's because... Um, the other platforms at Twitter generally don't have uh, desktop development, so the Android app doesn't work very well on a desktop. Um, the iOS, same thing. They're made for smaller screens, and so a lot of the, the main feature thinking goes into that, that primary main column format. Mm -hmm. um, so we might add something and not forget, or forget to test it on desktop. We had one where you know, we did some work on the, the layout stuff, and browser stack, we'd tested in IE and Edge and Chrome on desktop, but we hadn't made the browser screen wide. So that was a case where we weren't exercising the size of the screen. We were testing on the platform, but we didn't exercise that specific feature, and we actually broke all of the desktop stuff. Um, I think it's very easy to get into that trap, and I don't have a good answer for you on how to avoid it. Um, other than I think the component-based testing makes it so that you can push that more into unit tests uh, and sort of trust your browser detection to work and trust the functionality to work as a whole outside of that. It's very hard to do in, in those integration tests. I think, was there a question in the, the back corner too? Did you have a question? No? Okay. Um, anyone else? Yeah, there's one more on the... So the KaiOS stuff really interests mm -hmm. me. I used to do some uh, Firefox OS stuff back in the day. So, um, so I know KaiOS is still running like the, ver the last version of uh, Firefox that Firefox OS ran, which is like super old at this point. So I'm guessing it's the same code base that y'all ship to like Chrome and stuff, but just with like tons of polyfills for almost everything. Yep. Okay. Cool. Yeah, uh, the question, uh, KaiOS, there's actually some versions that won't run the PWA. I think if you're on KaiOS 1, it's Firefox, I don't know, 20 or something, yeah. and it, it just won't run. Okay. Um, we try and polyfill so far back, and we're looking now to try and do uh, a second bundle that's not polyfilled um, and supports sort of the modern JavaScript cool. stuff, so it doesn't have all the translations for classes and promises and whatever else happened in the last, I don't know, four years of web development. Gotcha. Yeah, I was wondering, because it's such an, like, that is built on, sub, sub, uh, built on top of such an old platform, if it was old enough to the point where you needed so many polyfills where it was actually 
a separate code base, but. I think the newer iOS supports Firefox something more reasonable. It's like cool. in the okay. 30s or 40s. Yeah, yeah. And so it actually has enough that it's pretty consistent with the Safari 7 polyfills and whatever else there is. Cool. So I'm, I'm going to ask a question, actually. Um, so you mentioned that like Twitter doesn't really have an offline experience. Yeah. Um, what are you all using Service Worker for, if anything? Uh, we actually use it for a ton. And there is a little bit of an offline experience. We don't have. Um, we don't have offline consumption so much, but if you already have something, you're going through BART and you lose your connection, we do actually do background sync. So if you favorite a few tweets or retweet something, um, when you come out, we'll replay those actions and send them. Uh, and to the user, when they're in this offline state, it'll appear as if it worked. So that's some bit of offline functionality. We do all of the um, bundle caching. So if you come to the site, we only download what you need. But in the service worker, we'll download things we think you might use. And this means that if you do happen to lose a connection and you want to go to your settings, that will just load instantly and hopefully makes the rest of the site faster. So it sort of continues to load in the background. Um, we do push notifications. One of my favorite things, if you ever want to talk push, is I did a lot of the push work. And uh, native Android has a cool thing where it'll bundle all your notifications into like a little thing you can unroll. That doesn't exist in the web push spec. And so we did a lot of custom work around if you get five or six likes on a tweet, we'll actually roll those together into one notification and continue to update it. So the goal there was we understand people get a lot of spam, especially on Twitter. If you were to get one notification for every reply or every like on a tweet, it'll add up really quick. Um, so we wanted to make sure that it was one like or, or one notification per action per tweet. Um, and a lot of that codes in the service worker. Uh, there's a couple other things with caching the shell is in there. Uh, we used to cache the most popular emoji because um, we do those as images for some of the platforms. So we'd cache the top 10 emoji. I think we got rid of that. There's fun stuff. There's a lot of things you can do with service workers that are, that are pretty neat. Any others? Going once, going twice. All right. Thank you very much, Charlie. Thank you, everyone. All right, I'm going to invite Justin to, to come up and talk a bit about uh, build tools and such. Um, we're on a normal dongle here. Can you hand this back to Diego? Um, Justin introduced, introduced himself earlier, but he is a, a colleague of mine on the, uh, what does PAC stand for now? It, they just changed uh, it, didn't they? It's a... Uh, uh, partner something, uh, partner apps and experiences. Okay. It's changed since I was on that team. But um, yeah, Justin, uh, relatively recent addition to the Microsoft world, about six months. Oh, is it a year now? Oh, wow, it's a year. Um, and he came, came to us from the Ionic space, so he's got a lot of experience in the, uh, in the framework world as well. So if you have framework questions, you can hit him up with those. Are you looking for the micro USB? Yes. <laughs> Dongles are not our specialty. Oh, you need you need yeah. Diego's, yeah, need or no? He's he's got one too. We're good. All right, USB-C man, it's a killer. <laughs> Funny, I didn't. That that's the second gen. Yeah, that's fine. All right. Okay. Without further ado, Justin. Hopefully, yeah. There we go. All right. Thanks. So let me get into slideshow. So I made these slides partly on the plane yesterday, partly on a Friday afternoon, and then partly last night. So they are not the most pretty slides in the world, but I think they get the point across at least. Cool. There we go. All right. So, yeah, so I'm going to talk about mainly web tooling today. Um, it's pretty informal. I just kind of wanted to talk about PW Builder. That's the tool that I work on nowadays. And also some of the other kind of cool tools out there like uh, Lighthouse, WebPageJS, and then um, an accessibility extension that I think is pretty cool. 
Um, so we'll talk about going from zero to PWA using modern web tooling. So um, Jason's talk talked a little bit about some of the stuff that I'm gonna talk about at first um, on this slide, on these slides, but it's only a little bit, so no repetition. There we go. So apps on the web, so um, Jason did a really good like deep dive into this this morning, I think. Um, but there's kind of, in, in my mind, there's kind of like three kinds of apps on the web app spectrum, as I kind of like to call it. Um, so there's like normal web apps, and this is stuff like uh, Amazon.com, things like that. Amazon is responsive now, but older Amazon.com. Um, YouTube is now kind of responsive, but not. But just normal like web apps that we probably all built that are just you know nice, nice kind of websites that give you some kind of functionality that is useful to um, to you as a user. Um, responsive web apps, on the other hand, on the other hand, tend to be more um, uh, you know mobile focused and stuff like that. So we kind of took these web apps and kind of made them into mobile. Uh, you know, where they worked on different screen sizes and stuff like that, but they're still not like the full app experience on the web, right? And then we have this idea of PWAs. Um, so PWAs, you know, progressive web app, it kind of gives you that, that full, that kind of next step into being a, a full app, right? Um, but there's, there's kind of, you know, this is very vague, right? So you can build one of these things or you can start at one point and then you can, you know, take it to a PWA, but how do you do that exactly? There's what do you build, how do you do it, what tools do you use, et cetera. Um, so that's kind of what I'm gonna talk about today. So the first part, we're just gonna kind of assume that we're, we're at this web app stage, right? Um, so let's just say we have a, a simple web app that we built, maybe it's responsive, um, because you know most people use mobile nowadays. Um, most sites have to be responsive, at least as a base. Um, and let's say we wanna take that to a PWA, right? So we heard about PWAs, we really wanna do a PWA, um, but we don't wanna have to like rewrite our entire app or something like that. Um, so that is where a tool like PW Builder comes in. So PW Builder, I'm going to switch to the browser now, hopefully without messing up anything. See, boom. So, so PW Builder is something that I've been working on since I've been at Microsoft. Um, it's a PWA itself, so kind of PWA inception, right? PWA to build other PWAs with. Um, but basically, it's just it's a, a tool that, that helps you take your basic website or your, your you know, basic web app that you kind of built and take it that next step to a PWA. Really easy and really, really in a fast way. Um, so I have this simple little app that doesn't really do much of anything, um, but it basically just pulls like the top uh, GitHub repos for TypeScript um, off the GitHub API and then displays them in a list and you can also, um, oh, is this not showing on the, yeah. How do I switch the screen to browser? <laughs> we have two people can figure it out, hopefully. Is it something I have to do? It's I have my Hey, thank you, Aaron. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this is like a really basic web app that I built. Um, like I said, it, it doesn't really do much of anything. It it looks, I'm not a designer either, as you can tell. <laughs> um, but it, it gets the idea across. This is the basic web app that we're gonna transform into a PWA. Um, so I can just take this link. Also you can tell this is preview.pwbuilder.com. So this is um, kind of giving you a sneak peek at um, you can go to pwbuilder.com right now. There's a different experience, but this is the 2.0 experience we're calling it that we're working on. So as you can see here, I have an app, right? But it's not a PWA. I don't have a manifest. I don't have a service worker. Um, it's secure, so that's good because I'm on glitch, but it's not a PWA. So I want to just make this a PWA really quickly. I want to get that manifest and that service worker that I need to make it a PWA. Um, so I can go into where it says view generated manifest, and you can see that here I have a manifest that is generated for me. Um, and I can actually just, so I could go through and download this and stuff like that if I didn't already have an app. But since I'm just writing glitch and stuff like that, I just wanna copy and paste it. So I have my manifest here, just copy, make a file in here. Um, see how fast I can type with one finger. Luckily this demo doesn't require much talking or typing. Boom, 
So you can see now we have a manifest. Um, I can save this. And, and be able to That's another tool we're going to talk about. So you can see uh, it's not updating, but anyways, we already have a, a manifest now. So we could go into here, and actually, I know why it's not updating. So to have a manifest, you have to link to it first. That would help, right? There we go. So you can see now we should, if I did everything right. Yes, yeah, so now we have a manifest. Um, so we could go back to our web page, or back to PW Better, and we could not do anything, internet issues. Okay, anyway, so we have a manifest, um, and PW Better was able to give us a quick, a quick manifest there to, uh, to use. So that's one part of a PWA, right, is the manifest, but the other part is service worker. So you have to have a service worker to have a basic PWA. Um, so service workers can get pretty complicated pretty fast, uh, there's a lot to them. They're, it's a pretty low-level API. Um, so for PW Butter, we kind of just wanted to give people um, some basic service workers that you can use to cover common use cases. Um, so for example, we have an offline page, right? So a common starter for people is maybe they don't have a full offline experience for the PW yet, but they want to display something to the user instead of just uh, you know, a 404. Um, so you can use something like the offline page. Um, my favorite one we have right now is this cache first, then network. So this will cache, um, cache your files um, for you and, and serve those when you're offline um, and then go to the network also to make sure you have new stuff. So it's, that's one of the things with like service workers, right, is you can have scenarios where um, you know, stuff's not caching right and you wonder why. Um, these pre-built um, service workers kind of cover those weird use cases for you. Um, so we could just copy this, pop this into our index.html in a script tag. So this is a little bit of code to just register our service worker. And then we can go over here. I can spell right. Cool. And now we can go back and copy the code for our actual service worker. And rename this file to be an actual JavaScript file. So now within just a few minutes here, you could see now we have a service worker too. Um, so within just a few minutes, I was able to take an app that had no manifest or service worker and add a working manifest and service worker to it. I'm not gonna do the offline demo here because I don't wanna turn my machine onto airplane mode and then everything break, but you could get the idea. Now we have a service worker running, so now this is kind of a basic PWA. But as Charlie kind of touched on too, like you don't want to just throw a manifest and a service worker on your, um, you know, on your site and then call it a PWA. Um, you probably want to work on that a little bit. You know, make sure it's a, a good app-like experience first, including good performance and good accessibility. Um, you know, if someone can't even start to use your app because it's not accessible, then that's not really an app. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to move into next. So a lot of those like performance and accessibility too. That's those are also very complicated subjects with tons of user, uh, edge cases and stuff like that, but there's tools that can make it easier. Um, so there's a tool that I was gonna originally talk about called WebHint. Um, I ran into some issues with that tool. It's still being, used, or still being you know, worked on, um, but there's another cool tool from a Microsoft team that was recently came out with, which is an uh, um, extension. So um, there's the Accessibility Insights for Web extension. Um, so this is actually kind of showcasing a cool feature of the new version of Edge too. That's actually technically a Chrome extension but I'm running it on the new edge because yay. Um, so yeah, so let's, there's actually an accessibility issue that I already know um, with this app, so let's kind of show how you could pick that up really easily. Um, so uh, let's actually do it this way. So you can see here, um, I have the extension turned on. I have automated checks turned on, so this will kind of tell you automatically any, about any issues that you might have in your, uh, uh, accessibility issues in your app. Um, so we could go here and you could see, I'll make that bigger so we can tell. 
Um, so you can see that this is telling me that form elements must have labels, right? So this is something that is like really easy to miss. Um, you know, it's it's really easy to just forget to put a label on an input or not even put the label element, and then um, you know you don't you don't have that, and then that's an accessibility issue, right? Because someone who who may not be able to who may be using accessibility tools may not know what that input is for. Um, so this kind of gives you a really easy way to to just automatically say, okay, this is you know access an accessibility issue that that I need to fix. Um, so and it actually tells you some of the things you could do to fix it too. So for example, like you put an ARIA label on it or something like this. Um, that's one thing I really like about tools is when they tell you not just hey this isn't wrong this is wrong, but hey here's some things you can do to fix it too. So that's kind of why I like this extension for accessibility over some of the other extensions that are available because it gives you like right there in the UI a way you can you can fix it. Um, so uh, we can fix it real quick. And also it's just an extension too, so it makes it really easy to just, like it's just right there in your browser. So you can you know, just be de developing on your, on your app and because it's an extension, you can also test your accessibility right there in the middle of developing it. Um, so let's actually fix that issue real quick. Obviously, you want to put something more than that, but it gets the point across in the demo. And maybe that's not the right label or something. But um, actually, yeah, it is. Cool. Cool. So now you can see we don't have that accessibility issue anymore. So I went back, fixed it in Glitch real quick, added an ARIA label, which is something that it told me about that I should do. And now that it's on there, everything is working and the test uh, text checks out. There's no more accessibility issues on this page. Um, so that's the accessibility insights for web extension. Like I said, it's a Chrome extension, so you can use it on Chrome and also on the new version of Edge, too. All right. So um, let's see. So let's move on to performance. So accessibility is kind of one key point of an app, right? Like you want to be able to, to actually get to that app experience so it needs to be accessible. But another thing is performance, right? So performance is a really, you know, it's talked about all the time as a big part of PWAs is you know, providing that performant experience um, across also multiple devices and multiple connections too. So like I know I'm staying at a hotel that's like right down the street and the Wi-Fi there is horrible and I'm in the middle of San Francisco, right? So it's not just like a, a, you know, other places issue. Like we have network issues here you know, in the middle of you know, the tech capital of the US basically. Um, so performance is something that's really key and you, it, you know, really need to focus on. But it's also another one of those topics that is really, you know, a really deep topic, really hard topic. There's a lot of different things you can do. Um, you know, I, I spend, you know, I've spent multiple hours playing with different, uh, you know, scenarios and sometimes things are faster and you don't even really know why all of a sudden it's faster. It just is or maybe it's slower, but you're not really sure. Um, so there's a couple of tools you can use to make that easier. Um, so one of them is Lighthouse. So Lighthouse is an open source project by Google. Um, it lets you, it's actually right, built in right into uh, DevTools um, and Chrome and the new Edge. And you can use it to, um, to test the performance of your uh, app really quickly. So kind of the key point here is it's a simulated test. So it simulates an older device and it simulates a slower connection. Um, but let's just keep that in mind for a minute that it's a simulated test. So it's not like a real world actually actual test, but it at least gives you a quick idea of you know, the, the performance of your app. Um, so we can run it. So um, usually this doesn't take long, which is why I'm gonna run it in the uh, live stream, or yeah, during the live stream. Um, but you can tell it runs pretty quick. It does a, a quick, uh, quick test and then kind of gives you um, some you know, performance stats about your app. So you can see here, this is a really simple app. It's just JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. Um, so we get a pretty, pretty, pretty good score right off the bat. But if you had a more, um, you know, advanced app or something like that that was much bigger with a lot more functionality, um, you would probably have more work to do at, at this point. But Lighthouse gives you gives you that that first test. Um, but like I said, this is not an actual test on an actual device with an actual network. This is a simulated test. So I've found many times, uh, you know, doing performance testing and stuff where Lighthouse says that it's fine because it does like some uh, fake CPU throttling and like a fake 3G connection, but it's, it's not 
always the best in the world. It doesn't give you the accurate use case. Um, so that's where web page test comes in. So web page test is something that um, I just saw people using on Twitter one day and checked it out. And it's actually a really, really, really useful tool that people I don't think talk about enough, honestly. So we talk about Lighthouse all the time and how, how much that can help you. But like I said, if you actually get down and start like testing things, it, it, it can be a little inaccurate sometimes. Um, and that's where web page test comes in. So web page test, you can go to webpagetest.org uh, slash easy. That gives you a environment where you can test your app and run the app, and I'll go ahead and start running it now since it takes a minute sometimes. Cool. So I can run the test, um, and it will actually test my app on a real device with a real network. So this is actually running this test on a Moto G, Moto G4, which is a mid-end device. I mean, it's still a, a pretty costly device when you look at it, but that's like a nice mid-tier device that gives you, you know, a, a good kind of device that you can use as like an average uh, mobile device that most people have. Um, and it also runs it on a real 3G, like slow 3G connection too. So it's nothing simulated or anything like that. Like it's actually running your app in the actual environment with an actual like average mobile device with an average network connection. Um, and it also gives you a lot more uh, 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 in-depth info than Lighthouse does too, which is kind of why it takes a minute to, uh, to load here. But um, you could see as it's running, so it'll run multiple tests on your app to make, you know, to uh, get like an average of all the different scores. Um, but it actually runs, uh, yeah, so it runs like classic stuff that you would get straight out of Chrome DevTools, so the timeline that you might be used to um, so th this is probably one of the reasons we don't talk about this tool as much because you have to be a little bit more knowledgeable about like timelines and stuff to be able to get something from this info, but it, it, it still gives you um, more than uh, Lighthouse would. Um, so it's, it's worth using if, you, if you're willing to spend the time to take a look at the you know, info that it gives you and get something useful out of that. Um, but kind of the, the cool features that I like is right up here at the top you can see like my load time was 3.2 seconds in this test on an actual device with an actual network. Um, which is kind of funny when we look back at our Lighthouse test because our Lighthouse test said we were like super blazing fast, right? Uh, two and a half seconds speed index, which is like a second uh, faster than we were actually on like an, with web page test with an actual device with an actual network. So that's why I always stress to people um, to test on web page test too, because it gives you uh, much more accurate results. Um, then you would get with Lighthouse, and you can do um, multiple tests and all kinds of different things with it to, uh, to help you uh, uh, improve the performance of your app. Um, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I didn't really have too many slides for my talk. Like I said, I just made the slides over the last couple days, but I just wanted to kind of talk about some of the cool tools that I found out there that make it easy for me to build PWAs. Um, so uh, the last thing I just wanted to mention, um, PW Builder, if you want to try it, it's uh, preview.pwbuilder.com that you saw me using. You can use that. Uh, just give it a test where I'm working on it. Um, 2.0 is pretty close to being done, hopefully. Um, so yeah, get, feel free to give it a try. It's all open source. It's on GitHub. You can just look up PW Builder on GitHub and it'll pop up. Um, feel free you know, put up issues, ideas, um, pull requests, et cetera, et cetera. Cool. Thank you all. Thank you, Justin. Yep. Um, any questions for uh, for Justin? Anyone? 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 About anything? Does that have to be a long talk specifically? I can talk about performance and stuff too. Yeah. Okay. I'm just curious how the um, the goals of PWA Builder and the, like Google Workbox um, sure. like what's the overlap? What's the difference mm -hmm. between the goals of the That's two projects? That's a really good question, actually. So, uh, so Workbox is actually something that I want to integrate into PW Builder. Um, so like I showed, we currently have these like pre-built uh, service workers that um, you know, we've hand-coded, but that's obviously not the most ideal situation. Um, Workbox gives you a lot more customiz customizability and stuff like that in your service workers, and it also lets you like, tie into your build tools and stuff. Um, so that's something that we want to integrate, or I want to integrate into PW Builder. Um, as like an additional thing. So we will probably still have our pre-built service workers just because it makes it really easy to do things like I just did, which is just copy, paste, and throw it in there. But we also want to cover that more advanced use case too. Any other questions?
Thank you, Justin. Thank you. All right. Now I'm going to introduce you to the last and final speaker that I've known all my life, which is me. Um, <laughs> And so I'm actually going to talk a little bit, just a little bit, about kind of the future of PWAs, where things could be going. But my hope is that this actually becomes uh, more of a discussion about how we, the browser makers, can actually help you all um, to build what you need to build on the web. Right? We want to know what's blocking you, what would make you uh, more successful, which is why I've got my notebook up here to take notes as you're giving us feedback. Because um, I, I look at these as, as great opportunities for us to talk about that sort of stuff. So um, what's in store in the, the future, uh, both in the, the near term and the not so near term? Um, well, first of all, I think that we're looking at some more distribution options. And some of these have, have been brought up already um, in the talks today. So of course, we have uh, browser discovery. That's kind of the, the traditional way that PWAs have been discovered, especially in mobile. Um, but those of you who have been following uh, desktop Chrome as well um, have probably noticed that now we have ambient badging in the, um, in the URL bar in Chrome that is also available in uh, Edge. So all Chromium browsers, I think, are picking up that particular feature. Um, you also have the ability to install from uh, the, the additional menu, the triple dot menu, um, which is pretty cool. So automatic install, whether you're on desktop or on mobile. Um, store install we've talked a little bit about, and I think we've, we've seen kind of a couple of, of use cases um, for, and, and, and kind of conversations that I've had with people, use cases in, in being in a store, but I'm kind of curious, how many of y'all would like to be able to have PWAs installed via stores or distributed via stores? Is that something that's interesting or not all that interesting, kind of interesting? Thoughts? Anyone? Yeah. You got a, interesting? Interesting, yeah. Um, anybody think that stores are just gonna go the way of the dodo and not really interested in investing there? No strong opinions at all, apart from just interesting. Okay, all right. Um, so yeah, I think we're, we're trying to figure out what the relationship is between distribution on the web and distribution via browsers and what distribution in the store looks like. I mean, I think there are, um, there are a lot of companies, obviously Pinterest is one of them, that, that's interested in, and it was Pinterest, right, that you are, yeah, um, that are interested in that as an additional discovery mechanism because we've been dealing with, you know, 10 years effectively of, a little over now, of kind of being trained to go to app stores, especially in a mobile environment in order to install apps, less so on the desktop. Um, Although Apple's certainly been, been trying for a while to, to push their app store, uh, as have we. Um, so I think we're still trying to figure out what that looks like. And I know that you know, we've certainly, uh, at Microsoft, have published PWAs to the store and have had good success with that. But we're also starting to wonder, because Edge will be coming to Windows 7 in addition to Windows 8, Windows 10, Mac OS, maybe eventually Linux, um, there are places that the Microsoft Store is not. Um, so do we need to create some sort of curated discovery place that you know, maybe comes along with the browser along the lines of like an extension store, right? Maybe, maybe there, we need to have something like that. Um, if that's of interest to you, let us know, please. Like th these are all things that we're kind of playing with ideas, we're not sure, um, but we want your input on. Um, search install. Like, this is kind of an interesting thing. We, we talked about it at Build two years ago. It still hasn't come out in, in Bing yet. Um, but I love the idea of being able to you know, search for Pinterest or search for Twitter or search for Hulu and being able to install directly from the search results. That would be pretty amazing. I don't even need to go to your store, right? That would be, or go to your, your website uh, necessarily to be able to do that. Pre-install is another thing, and I think this is something that we've actually done with Twitter, if I remember correctly. There, there's been distribution. Um, since they were a PWA in the Microsoft Store, we had the opportunity to actually offer that as a pre-install option to some of the, the OEMs uh, that we work with, and I'm sure there's some marketing budget that's involved in the, the pre-install stuff, but that's kind of an interesting thing as well, um, so that you can be there immediately when somebody turns on their brand new machine. Um, which is something that we don't traditionally think of as a web thing, but is something that becomes possible in this space of PWAs. Um, and then it also gives us the opportunity, let's say we did go down this store route, um, to be able to have 
suggested PWAs, so that if you are looking at Hulu, for instance, maybe we also could suggest Spotify, or if you're on the Twitter one, maybe we also suggest some of the other social networks like Facebook or something like that that you might be interested in, or Pinterest that you might be interested in, um, so that we kind of help each other to discover other, uh, other PWAs that are available. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, in the Web App Manifest, there actually is a member for categorization. Um, and there are some other ones that are also there for like screenshots and stuff like that that don't often get used. But as you start to think about how your PWA might be represented in a store context, um, those are some really good keys to start to take a look at. Um, there's also one for IARC rating. Uh, for any of you who, who want to say, like, this is for 13 and up or, or what have you, that's another one that can be really useful kind of in that more marketing capacity. Um, in terms of, of PWA install, I'm kind of uh, curious for a show of hands. How many people are, are, have installed a PWA on mobile? Okay. How many of you are happy with that install experience? Okay, so if you're not happy with the install experience, what would you like to be different? Or what, what kind of pains you about it? There's a mic in the front center there and a front center there. Anyone want to share kind of what, they're, what they don't like about the experience or what they would like more of? Jason, I'm sure you have thoughts. Uh, on Android on a Nexus 5, um, the actual installation sometimes was just shockingly slow. Like, I would close the application and I'd go to look for the, the, the icon to, you know, to take screenshots or whatever and couldn't find it. Um, and I'd wait and wait. And then um, eventually they started adding sort of indicators in the notifications letting you know that it was being installed. But I, to this day, I don't understand why it was taking so long. Um, uh, it's faster on the Pixel 3 that I have now, but I fear that that may just be that I, I upgraded to a faster phone. Um, okay. So, yeah. So yeah, he's so. saying it's slow on the Pixel sometimes as well. Yeah. So like just the speed of installation, the like communication of what about what's happening there is, um, it's lacking in comparison to most app stores where you see some sort of progress indicator of what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good a good point. And I'm I'm guessing that the latency is probably because the web web APK is being generated on the fly and then being downloaded to your device, which may be slower, but yeah, that's a, it's a good one. Any other thoughts on what, what's lacking or what, what you would like more? How do you all feel about the, the UX? Do you feel like you're given enough information about, the, about what it is that you might be installing? I feel like there's, there's some like additional context that could be useful? Or maybe I'll ask this in a, in a different way. Are store pages useful? When you're, when you're going and you're looking at an app in a store, do you find value in, in being able to see screenshots and being able to see like a description and stuff like that? User ratings, useful, yeah, a little, little bit, okay. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's something that like we've just kind of internally toyed around with, like should the app install prompt look more like a store install prompt? I don't know. I don't know like what what that would end up looking like, but could we provide a little bit more context around what it is that you might be getting? Um, okay, so that's great feedback. Thank you. Any other thoughts that you want to just <laughs> I have more? more. Yeah. Um, I think the I mean the transition between the the um, the the app that somebody's using and the app that's the icon that's that's now appearing is. Um, it is really disconnected and depending on how well the handoff works between them, like it's like you could do an app install. Um, it happens in the background, which is great because you can continue using it, but like who the hell knows where that icon went to and then like, um, hey, will the person even remember if they just continue browsing that that has happened? Um, like it, like the, that there's like, it's, I think the prompting is pretty nice, but like after that, um, uh, and and being able to continue is really nice. Like there's no reason to like stop everything so the right. person, but but then like getting the person back into that app is is completely reliant on the user going and discovering where the icon went to and and then reopening the application and then depending on what sort of um, sharing is going on on which platform, maybe reauthenticating themselves and like um, all of that stuff. Yeah, 
That's a, that's a good point. Um, do you like the handoff on desktop better? Because so like on, on Chrome on desktop, for those who haven't tried it and done an install there, um, when you install it, it actually spawns that new app window and takes you into that context. I, as I do like that. Um, I dislike the fact that I can never find those icons again. Yeah. Like the the Chrome app icon location is just like it's buried. I the, have the no fact idea. that they're in Chrome apps in applications on a Mac. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I it took me a while. I had to I literally had to search to figure out where it was yeah. putting things. Yep. Um, or you have to find the, the menu item that says like manager apps. Yeah. And it used to be I thought that it used to be like that if you right clicked on Chrome's icon you'd see some of those apps, but um I, don't I like or there was like some sort of Chrome app launcher or something, but that's at one point the the new tab screen you could like go back and forth between like your favorites or the right. Google search and your apps. Some of that's still there. I yeah, think, some of but... it's there, some of it's not. But I think Chrome colon forward slash forward slash apps still gets you to your like all apps list, but it's still hidden in terms but of the I, you know system. like I have uh, the applications folder in my dock, yeah. right? And I I will click on it to see like the list of apps and. It, like, that's where the PWA should be. Yep. Yeah, agreed. Other thoughts, feedback? Yeah, please. Hello. Yeah, so <clears throat> a lot of it, I feel like it's um, when the user um, gets prompt and they have an option to choose, right? Like, maybe at that moment in time, they didn't feel like installing. Mm -hmm. And then subsequently, it's kind of like a educate, like, what is the user supposed to do? Like, where do they go to install it again if they want to. Like, there's this big gap where like users are not familiar with what add to home screen is and like they don't know how to get back to it. There's this like dot 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 menu that they're supposed to go to, right? Like so it's, yeah, it's I not feel intuitive like there's an opportunity all, right? there yeah. to make the whole experience better. Yeah. Yeah. And I really feel like that's kind of incumbent on browsers to try and like figure out how do we educate our users to be better aware of of these capabilities, and a lot of that has to do with like how do we surface PWAs. And I think a lot of us are still trying to figure out how we're, you know, how are we treating PWAs? How do we make them, you know, the most app-like and and accessible things that we can? Um, but yeah, that's yeah. Discovery is a challenge. Like how to how to install is a challenge for sure. I'm hoping the ambient badging makes that a little easier, but yeah. Yeah, yeah um, just to sort of add to that. Like something that's kind of come up before with the Pinterest um, is that. You know, like we have control over when we can show like the add to home screen prompt. Yeah. Um, but it'd be kind of cool to like. One second, but just for everybody, the, being able to show it as the on before install prompt, yeah. if I remember correctly, yeah. that's the event. Yeah. So we have control over like when we can prompt the user. Um, but it'd be even, it'd be awesome if we could also have like control over like what exactly we're prompting. Um, I mean, we could, you know, we ha we have the option obviously to like show our own UI, but then the user experience kind of sucks because now you're kind of prompted twice, right? You have like the custom prompt and then you have kind of have like the native prompt. So it'd be kind of nice if there was a way to sort of like have more fine grained control over the native prompt. Yeah, I, I agree. It's so you end up in a situation like Charlie was showing earlier with the notifications where it's like, do you want to turn on push notifications? And then you get the do you want to really allow push notifications? Um, and I think one of the challenges because I've I've kind of thrown that up as like, hey, it'd be really awesome if we could actually, as a developer, like say why we want geolocation access or why we want push notification access or something like that. Can I provide some of that information? Could that be maybe exposed to users in some way as part of the dialogue that, that asks them for this permission? And um, I, I basically was told, yeah, that's a huge security problem when you start to allow developers to actually insert stuff into native UI um, because then they could be misleading people and, and you end up in kind of this like weird privacy space. But I'm, I'm hoping we'll be able to figure out a better way to do that and maybe that's some better UX on the browser side or maybe it's, you know, testing. I mean, like Charlie and, and company have been doing a ton of like round robin iterative testing trying to figure out you know, the best approaches to these different things. And I'm sure that, you know, where they've landed with push notifications now is not where they were when they initially rolled out push notifications on, on mobile.twitter. Uh, so my hope is that we can, like, continue learning from each other and continue testing and try and figure out what are some of these best ways to expose things. So 
I encourage you to please continue testing and, and report your findings, like how, how things perform, because that really helps all of us figure out, like, A, is there a pattern that web developers should be following, but B, is there some, some way that the browsers can help to lift you up as well and, and provide you with what you need so you're not having to do as much heavy lifting on your own? Because I see that as our role, right? We're, we need to help you to be successful, right? Like we need to be there to, to support you and what it is that you need. So that's, that's great. If you can definitely do that and, and give us more feedback, that would be awesome. Other thoughts on this piece before I move on? How are the subtitles doing? Is it catching me? Am I too quick? Is it doing? So that's, that's built into PowerPoint in the Insiders versions. It will automatically transcribe. I think it will automatically do translations too. There's like a subscription link, I think, that you could hit and view it in your own language. Um, fun with AI, yeah. Dog fooding. This may actually make me switch back to PowerPoint all the time <laughs> because it's kind of a cool feature. All right, so the, uh, the next step, oh, uh, no, I talked about this, I guess, but okay. So the next uh, thing I wanna talk about in terms of future of PWAs is uh, this entire idea of bringing more of the native capability suite um, to desktop. Now, you know, in the, the last two years as I've been working a lot on PWAs, and especially in, in working with Twitter on, on their PWA, in Windows, I've been diving deep into the Windows internals, which we refer to as WinRT APIs. Um, and these are things like the contacts picker, like the timeline that, that Charlie was showing, uh, jump lists and that sort of stuff. And I've been trying to think of, like, what of these features uh, are out there that we really do need as first-class citizens on the web? Um, and so some, some of these things that have cropped up time and time again from, from different people we've talked to are things like file system access. Um, this is really useful for things like Office and Google Docs and those sorts of, of systems that want to be able to store things on disk. Native share to and from. Um, Jason talked a little bit about the share to. Uh, Charlie also talked a little bit about the share from. Uh, so share to is being able to take the page that you're on and share it to another application. Uh, that is navigator.share. Uh, the share target, which is the, the kind of recipient end of this, is part of the web app manifest. Um, and we're currently working on version two of that spec right now. Uh, version one is just for text and URLs, uh, basically to be shared into an app. Version two will actually allow you to share in files. Um, so the, the Charlie mentioned they have a, an implementation for Windows currently that integrates with the share charm. That's using the WinRT APIs, but we're working on a share target V2 spec that will allow you to share images, videos, uh, all of those sorts of things. So that would be of huge interest to, to Pinterest. I'm imagining you guys are integrating with the share charm for your Windows version, right? Um, so being able to do that just by declaring in your web app manifest, like this is the target page that this should be sent to and these are the file types that we uh, accept, right? That's pretty awesome, uh, really, really powerful. Um, along those lines, also being able to register your PWA to open certain file types um, is another thing that, that we're talking about doing. That would be pretty cool. Um, Charlie also showed the jump list feature, which is the, the context menu for the icons. Um, this is something some of you may be familiar with in um, iOS and Android. On iOS, it's the force touch action on an icon. It gives you like a, a list of certain activities that you can uh, do. Um, or on Android, it's a long press. Or on most desktop systems, it's a right click on the icon. Um, We're looking to bring that also to the web app manifest and possibly uh, in version two as a JavaScript API so that it can actually be something that's fully dynamic. Um, so that's a, a pretty cool feature uh, that we're working on right now. Um, very excited about that. Um, then we have uh, biometrics. This is something that Jason already talked about. This is coming pretty far along um, where you can start to do things like log in with your fingerprint, log in with your face. Um, all of those things are kind of wrapped up in the web authn spec. Um, I'm hopeful at some point that some of you begin to integrate web authn into your login systems. That would be really nice. Um, more and more uh, WebRTC stuff. I think this is finally starting to, now that we, Microsoft, have moved over to Chromium as well, I feel like this is a little bit more coalescing around, um, around a good standard for doing real-time communication, video chat, that sort of stuff. Um, Geofencing is 
an additional layer on top of just being able to get geolocation, so being able to know what room somebody is in within a particular uh, office space or a library or something like that. These sorts of uh, very, very um, privacy invasive <laughs> APIs are going to be coming, and I'm gonna talk about the privacy stuff in a moment. Um, but, but there's definitely being work being done on that. Um, having web-based badging, uh, this is another thing that certainly a lot of the, the social apps are very interested in being able to do. Um, straight up badging is relatively easy and kind of far along, I think Chromium actually already shipped it if I remember correctly. Um, pardon? Origin trial for it, yes. Yeah. So there's an origin trial for it right now uh, for badging. Um, one of the challenges that we've seen, and I don't think this is overcome yet, is that um, badges are the sort of thing that you want to be able to update typically via push as opposed to via pull uh, or via pulling. Um, but as the push notification is push notification spec is written currently, um, it does not allow for a push notification that does not result in some sort of uh, visual indicator for the user. Um, so we don't have, I think some people refer to it as transparent push, basically. But ideally, that's what we would want to have is some sort of transparent push notification that wouldn't prompt the user with a, uh, a notice in their inbox, but could update the badge dynamically, which would be really useful. Um, so if folks agree that transparent push is a good idea, that would be really useful for you to come up and, and give me your name, and I can include you in the, uh, the discussion of that, and hopefully we can get that um, get that driven through and get some adjustments to the spec to allow for that. Um, unlimited storage, this is something that we've talked about. It's especially important to those of you that are media partners who want to be able to offline a movie or offline a, an album or something like that. Um, currently all PWAs are still bound to the uh, disk usage that a browser is allowed to and there's a complex algorithm that I won't go into for that. Um, if you are a PWA in Windows via the Microsoft Store, all of your uh, disk storage um, limits are actually removed, um, but we wanna make sure that we can have that same sort of thing if you install from the browser to, to not necessitate the use of a store. Um, so there's a lot of discussion, and I encourage you, if, if you're at all interested in this, there's a lot of discussion going on currently, um, both in discourse, which is where we tend to discuss a lot of these, uh, a lot of these future specs, and in, GitHub issues and such, um, and on some of the Chromium bugs too, uh, around what this should look like and how do we do it in a way that is respectful of our users, um, because obviously that's a huge privilege to have, to have like unlimited usage or you know, quote unquote unlimited. Obviously there's limits to how much storage you have, but it's a big ask and we wanna make sure that we do it right, that we're not um, opening up a, a vector for abuse. You know, Does it make sense, for instance, to require that a, a website be installed before unlimited becomes an option. That, that's one of the questions that we're floating. Um, you know, maybe we want to have that level of commitment. And, and it would be another gate, just like, you know, currently a lot of APIs, like Service Worker, like Geolocation now, have to require HTTPS. So in the same way, maybe install becomes another gate for some of these APIs, um, because we want to ensure that there's a certain level of engagement from the users before we grant that sort of opportunity. Um, Charlie also mentioned they're tracking the contacts API. Um, this is something that existed in Firefox OS, um, and they had a pretty interesting spec for that. There is uh, currently some, some explainer slash proposal ideas around what that could look like. Um, those of you who, uh, like me, have been on, uh, on the web and in the, the mobile space for a long time might remember PATH. Um, does anybody remember the debacle that happened with PATH when they launched? So they'll, this was another social app, uh, kind of a journaling-ish. It's like Twitter for journaling, if you could. Um, but when they initially launched as an iOS app, um, they asked for permission for access to your address book and then sucked up the whole thing and shoved it up to their servers. Um, that's not great, right? That's a huge privacy invasion. Um, so one of the things that's been discussed is um, having the browser actually, or, or the OS rather, or the browser and OS in, in concert, um, act as a proxy for this sort of information. So maybe you as a developer say, hey, I'm interested in my user's contacts. I want names and email addresses only. And then that information gets surfaced to the user 
that the browser or that the, the site is requesting access to that information. And then the browser prompts them with their address book information and they can choose the contacts that they specifically want to share. And so it's very clear and the user is always in control of what information is being passed over to the third party as opposed to having zero control uh, because their entire address book is being sucked in. I'm sorry if you want to suck in everybody's address book. Um, and then uh, there's a lot of other things that are being worked on, but one that I'm particularly interested in is ex re-examining the idea of permissions um, and potentially looking at time boxing permissions. So maybe I only want to allow Best Buy to have access to my geolocation for an hour, right? I don't want them to have it in perpetuity. Um, so you know, for all of these very privacy uh, related sensitive APIs, I think it's really important for us to, uh, us as browser makers, to you know, do all that we can to protect our users and to help them protect their own data and their own privacy and not overshare, right? Always erring on the side of, of being protective of our, of our users. So if that's something else that, that you think is interesting or you would like to, uh, to know more about, hit me up, because this is, this is something that hasn't generated into a, an explainer or a spec or anything like that yet, but it's something that some of us are starting to discuss that I think is super important. Um, so a lot of this work, a lot of this sort of uh, capabilities work and native APIs work is bundled in the Chromium space under something that we call Project Fugu, um, which is, is kind of amusing because if you cut it wrong, you end up killing yourself, right? Um, for those of you who are familiar with Fugu as a sushi. Um, so if you uh, want to look into some of these things that are being discussed, if you go to the Chromium bug list and you do a search for Fugu, you'll be able to, to see all of the APIs that are, that are currently being uh, discussed or implemented and such. Um, but now I actually want to stop talking and open it up to you to find out you know, what do you want to be able to do or what do you need to be able to do in order to be successful on the web, in order to be successful with PWAs or just as a website what can we do to make your lives easier? Um, what can we do to you know, pave cow paths that you're spending a lot of time building JavaScript and, and other kind of workarounds to be able to do? Um, so I'll open up the floor to, to questions, ideas, thoughts, uh, all that sort of stuff. Or to online if anything comes through, Justin. Anyone? Charlie. So, uh, I think this is really cool. I'm looking forward to a lot of those APIs. And I'm wondering, um, two-part question. First, what's the thing that you're most disappointed isn't on that list yet, that you think we need and isn't quite here? Um, and then I'll give you mine, which is, uh, I think that we're having trouble with this, and I mentioned it, um, people on Twitter who just keep coming after me for this offline stuff. And it feels like it's very hard to still create an app while the app's not running. Um, and for us, you mentioned pushing for badge count. And previously in the day, someone mentioned that we actually get rate limited for push notifications. And if we do badge count, it's going to triple that. It's our yep. most, yeah. So is there, um, how do we think about apps existing when the site isn't open? Um, there's a previous proposal for periodic sync, which would allow us to fetch content to show when the user is offline that's fresh and would sort of meet our product requirement um, and could be used as well for something like that sync or even for push notifications um, for a site that doesn't have the ability to implement all the back end and get up and running on that. Yeah, I mean, I think background sync has a lot of potential, or I think it's called periodic sync in some of the, the specs as well. Um, and I think there, it's in Chromium, right? But it You can background sync, which requires, so that's what we do, background sync is like you, you hit a notification. But that's a one-off sync, right? And we go, yeah, we go off of fetch. It would be nice to say, hey, every three hours, we want to yep. fetch the home timeline and like store it in case the user opens it without yep. actually needing something to come from within the app being open itself. Right, to be able to basically prime it under the hood. Yeah, um, yeah I totally think that that's a, that would be, I know that's a spec they've been working on. I think that's one thing that would be really nice to have in a variety of scenarios, uh, both for you, because you could then have at least a more up-to-date 
offline version, potentially, right? If you update it every three hours or every hour or what have you, maybe even being able to let a user decide how often to update it. Um, in the case of a publication, you know, a, a newspaper or something like that, maybe they have, um, you know, in, in the morning at five in the morning or something like that, it automatically refreshes with the latest edition of the, the, the paper, which I think Financial Times does uh, today or at least tries to do. Um, yeah, that, that sort of thing would be extremely helpful. You could do badge updating. You could kind of bundle a bunch of different things under that, that sort of rubric. Um, yeah, to me, like things, I, I really feel like we need to get the permissioning stuff locked down. Um, you know, there's, there have been so many, there have been way too many scandals at this point for in terms of user privacy, user data. Um, I, you know, I, this may be heresy to some of you, but I don't think blockchain's gonna solve everything. <laughs> I know some people think blockchain is going to solve privacy. I don't, I don't know if that's true. Um, because somebody's always going to get a copy of your data, but being able to control how much of that data uh, you share and what you share with them, I think is really important. Um, and it's the sort of thing that, like, once I hand over, like, if you, if you ask me, Charlie, for names and email addresses of people that I want to look up on Twitter, once I've given it to you, I have no control over that data anymore, right? I can never ask for it back. I can't delete it off your servers. Or even if you said that I could, I have to, like, believe that you're actually going to do it, right? Um, so I think you know, doing what we can to protect users on their side and put them more in control of what it is that they're, um, that they're granting in terms of permissions, that they're, they're exposing of themselves at a given time, I think that's a really critical thing that we need to figure out. Uh, you know, in, in, I would ideally love to see it in the next year. I don't know if that's gonna happen, but um, yeah, being a, a privacy uh, person, I, I think that'd be a really good thing. Did you have something you were gonna add? Anyone else have, have thoughts, things they're blocked on? Everybody, everything's hunky-dory on the web, everybody's happy? Yeah? Everybody's just tired, wants to go home. I'll go again, okay. since I have a mic in my hand. Um, it sounds like a lot of these things are coming from Chrome to Edge, uh, benefiting that way. What are, what's something you're proud of bringing from Edge to uh, Chrome, perhaps? Because there are places where yeah. the so, Edge experience is better. Yeah, so the shortcuts better. piece is, is something that we're actually doing the implementation on. Um, you know, kind of as we're moving into this new Chromium space, it's, it's exciting for me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take off my, uh, my official Microsoft hat, um, but also still being a Microsoft employee. Like, I'm excited for the fact that like we're not spending as a browser team as much time trying to have the same compat with another browser that we have no control over the fact that they you know like how quickly they iterate on things right um, and at a certain point in time I I remember that uh, Chrome's DevRel team was like the size of Edge Engineering right like we were just swamped by how you know how many people they had on chrome improving that platform plus all the open source people we just like we couldn't keep up you know um it is what it is and i think this move over to chromium really kind of clears the decks and allows us to think about the future and and to actually concentrate on what do we need how do we what do we need to do to empower our customers to be able to serve their users and to be successful on the web and that's really exciting to me um so we are absolutely looking at like how can we make the web better. Um, we very much want your input as to how we can help to make the web better. We want to know what your problems are. We don't necessarily need to know solutions. Um, but let's say um, there's something that you want to fix, like you're having problems understanding how uh, requests are routing through your service worker, for instance. Um, Maybe that's something that we can help fix in DevTools to give a little bit more introspection into that. And any changes that we make to DevTools, like the vast majority of those are gonna be upstreamed into Chromium, and they're gonna end up helping you in Google, in Google Chrome as well as in Vivaldi or Opera or any of the other browsers that are Chromium-based. Um, it's even gonna help Electron, right? Like all of these, all of these changes are gonna improve things. Um, and that's, that's pretty exciting to me. Um, so in terms of these uh, APIs that I, I mentioned, uh, Shortcuts is one that we are actively working on currently. Um, we are also likely to be heavily involved in the file system API because we have a lot of experience in that space. Um, and we have a, a big customer in Office, obviously, um, that is wanting to move into the PWA space more. Um, we're going to be actively involved in like the file opening, um, probably getting a bit more involved in, in the share target v2 spec, um, those sorts of things. And, and yeah, pretty much 
uh, unless there is a very, very, very good reason why we would want to keep something as a like Microsoft Edge thing only, um, we're open sourcing everything. So our, our default stance is anything that we're working on uh, goes up to Chromium Core. Yeah. So <clears throat> a big thing for me is, uh, so the CSS Grid API, so Firefox DevTools have a really, really good tool for yep. CSS Grid. Like that's pretty much the only way I can like do CSS Grid without Flexbox going crazy. Too. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's something that I would love to see in, in Edge and in Chromium yeah. um, is something similar to that. Maybe even for Flexbox. So if the Flex, Flexbox API is much simpler, but it would be cool if you could like just in DevTools say like, okay, this is what this is going to look like with justify content center just really quick, like with buttons, mm -hmm. not having to write out the rules and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. The 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 design tools in Firefox are really impressive. The um the font inspection is also like they have a whole tool set for variable fonts, um, which are are pretty awesome. Um, so that's where you can adjust all the axes and and such in order to to tweak your font styles and stuff. It's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, I would love to see the the Chromium Dev tools have that stuff rolled up into it as well. Other thoughts. Everybody tired and want to go home? Yeah, feeling it? Charlie, you have something else? Nope, I'm just playing with the mic. Oh, yeah. Um, so this is more of like a, with regards to like service, working directly with service workers and like the cache API, things like that, it's all very low level. Mm -hmm. And I almost feel like there's, at least with talking with um, some developers who have had to touch service workers and things like that, it's almost um, overwhelming. Or, and, and there's like a barrier to entry there. Yeah. And I know one of the nice things about Workbox is that it kind of provides APIs for some common scenarios, right? Like you want to do um, an app shell when you navigate to, when you navigate to a route. Yep. Um, and I almost feel like there might be um, a set of APIs that we could add or th that for like those common scenarios without having to pull in Workbox and things like that. Yeah, yeah, I agree, and I my hope is so. There's there's been a significant push at the W3C and other standards organizations to move towards these more low-level APIs, um, in order to allow developers to build their own tools. But yes, like at a certain point, once they're once they become cow paths, there we should look to pave those in order to to make it easier for people to do what they need to do, right? Um, just like. Yes, you could absolutely do client-side validation for your forms, but we eventually made that part of the HTML5 spec, right? And it made it so much easier to, to write declarative markup and have it do what you wanted it to do. Um, and yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree, and my hope is that that is what happens. Same thing with CSS Houdini. I don't know if you, if you all have looked into that at all, but CSS Houdini is, is a spec that allows you to get really deep into the process of CSS being parsed and being painted to the screen and layout and all of that sort of stuff, and you can start to build your own CSS using JavaScript there, which is extremely powerful, um, but my hope is that it doesn't stop there, that if somebody creates something really neat, that they don't have to then import that JavaScript to every site on the web that eventually we're like, okay, you know, Facebook is using this and Pinterest is using this. Like, that's a lot of web traffic just there that if we added this into the browser, like, we would save so much bandwidth across the globe, right? At that point, you know, I, I'm still trying to figure out and rationalize when those cow paths become so well trod that it makes sense to, to pay them. But, um, but yeah, I think you know, getting more of, of this, this same sort of signal from, from folks would be really um, useful to try and say, like, okay, we've got these low-level low APIs. We can get into the weeds if we want to, but at the same time, we can build higher-level stuff on top of that that maybe makes some of the, the rote stuff much easier. Yeah, that's great feedback. Thank you. Anyone else? No? No? All right. Okay. Well, then I think, unless there are any other questions, Milo, do you have anything else that, that you want to add? No? No? Yeah. Be able to. Oh, sorry. <laughs> there you go. Uh, uh, we would love to get feedback on this event. Uh, we hope, we, we know already that uh, we had a few people uh, follow the screencast, and we're going to publish some of this content uh, likely on pwabuilder.com. Mm -hmm. Uh, but also, we like to keep this conversation going, uh, so that you know we could organize n n next events, uh, thinking about and focusing on the future of PWAs. Maybe some of those topics that you just talked about. Yeah. Uh, 
and beyond that, it would be great to uh, kind of expand this community. So let let, let you know start using the Slack channel, for instance, or uh, agree on uh, uh, catalyzing conversation around some Twitter handle uh, that you know people like with, with no preference, um, and so that we can keep this conversation going. Agreed. Yeah, I think the Slack channel is it's something that's existed for, or the, rather the, the Slack uh, workspace is something that's existed for a while that a lot of us kind of in the in the insular uh, PWA community have been been using. Um, but I'd love for more of you uh, who've, who've joined it specifically for this event to participate in it going on, to ask questions. Um, there are a lot of people kind of from across all of the different browser vendors um, who participate there. And so it'd be great to, to hear from you. Um, my info, if you want to hit me up uh, after this event, if you have things that you want to talk about, specs that you want uh, want to work on, um, you know, ideas that pop into your head as you're, you know, taking a shower tonight or tomorrow morning, that you're just like, oh my gosh, I should have asked this. Um, please, please reach out to me. Um, my DMs are open as well, so you can uh, can DM me if you don't want to make it a public reply. Um, but please do reach out. We do want to hear from you. We do want to work together with you to make the web better. Um, and so. Damon, I'll open it, open it up to you to, to wrap up if you want. Do you have anything, any final notes you want to say? Or, Oh, Justin, yeah, yeah. Um, so with Midler's help, um, we, I've already headed out this to some people before the uh, talk started up again. Um, but we, uh, as Milo said, this is you know first time we're doing this event. We kind of wanted to get a review of what people thought of the event, you know, speakers, et cetera. Um, thank you, Milo. <laughs> um, so anyways, I, like I said, I've already handed out to, I think, most people on this row, but over there. Um, I have sheets over here that you can come grab if you want to give us a review. Um, and then along with that, I also have book codes for Jason's book, um, along with instructions on how to get the book using those codes too. Um, we have a limited amount of codes. So yep, if you want to come get a paper, then I can give you a code. Um, and if, if you download the book while you're here, Jason will sign your iPad. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a Sharpie, a big thick one. All right, yeah, Damon. So just, oh, well. Um, so just one thing um, for, for everyone that's here is uh, this is the first of a, a few different things that we're looking as a collaboration between Samsung and Microsoft around progressive web apps. And so this was very much focused on um, the people that were here, decision makers and things like that. But um, throughout the rest of the year, we're really looking at um, exploring and inviting folks from the design side, as well as also from the technical side. So in the future, um, we definitely invite you back or those that you feel that would be the best audience um, for designers who are looking at how to get involved with the proper tools of building progressive web apps, or also uh, the next one will probably be more focused on developers and, and looking at how to get involved. So, um, so just please uh, stay tuned, I guess, to the Slack channel and things like that. Um, also, I would just like to um, say and, and give a round of uh, applause, please, um, for the team from Microsoft uh, that contributed all of our speakers who came in, uh, Samsung as well. Um, I think we did a really good job of putting something together that we weren't quite sure how it would turn out, but this seemed to be pretty awesome. Um, so I would just like to say thank you to all of my co-organizers and speakers for that. Yeah, thanks to everybody. Thank you, Michael. And thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. Yep, and we're out of here early, so yeah, enjoy awesome. your day. Have a great afternoon.